Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's Yonfeld Town Council for Tuesday, January 19th, 2016. I will go ahead and uh, welcome our audience tonight and call the meeting to order. And we'll start with roll call, please. Councilmember Muller? Here. Councilmember Durham? Here. Councilmember Dornbecker? Here. Vice Mayor Hall? Here. Mayor Denbar? Here. I invite uh, former Vice Mayor Lewis Chilton, who is joining us this evening, to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. I know we look different from that perspective, Lewis, <coughs> but you have you seem to have a bigger smile on your face back there. <laughs> Next up, we're going to uh, move to adopt tonight's agenda, but we have uh, several changes and a couple um, electronic corrections to make. First, we have some numbering um, errors or typos that will be corrected in the official. Uh, agenda, but we also have an item that is going to be moved. I think uh, Councilmember Moeller was going to uh, make that request. Yes, I'd like to make a motion that we move current item 12 to after the presentations, so it will now be new item 11. So because the numbering system was off, that means the administrative regular item 15-617 uh, <coughs> which is the uh, consideration of the Yellowfield Community Foundation will move to after our three presentations. And I say three presentations because what is listed here uh, as uh, items 9A and 9B of the consent calendar, uh, public safety, uh, CAL FIRE and sheriff reports will actually be in the presentation section. So we only have one item on consent which is the uh, filing of the financial reports and then we will have three presentations first Cal Fire second the sheriffs and then the presentation from Rancho Cucamonga City Council and then uh, just a final correction I think it's a final correction on um, the staff informational reports we have one report which is the Hopper Creek flood control project update that report was just listed twice uh, erroneously so with all of that, I think uh, we are ready for a motion to uh, adopt the amended uh, and corrected agenda. Is uh, there any further stuff to straighten out? No? All in favor? Aye. 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 It was moved and seconded. Oh, yes. We so you moved it. Do we have a I'll second? second. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I was, see, I even <clears throat> got out of order. Uh, seconded by Vice Mayor. Now we have all in favor. Aye. 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 And that passes unanimously. Whew. What are we doing again? That was tricky. <laughs> so now, if it's not confusing enough, we're going to recess to, uh, this is the speed round. We're going to recess to our responsibilities as the Yountville Housing Authority for our special meeting. So I will recess from our regular council meeting and call to order the Yountville Housing Authority. Um, first item is roll call. We can recognize that all uh, directors, is that what we're calling ourselves? Um, our present Officer. officers. Um, public comment on the Housing Authority. Seeing none. Election of officers, uh, election of the chair and vice chair. Historically, I believe those are the mayor and vice mayor. So moved. Second. <laughs> I second. <laughs> I think That's that was Councilor Dornbecker with the second. <laughs> uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, thank you. Consent calendar, approval of minutes. I believe we have one abstention from Council Member <coughs> Durham. And just, uh, Julie, for the record, maybe we have to say this three times, but Council Member Durham is going to abstain from the minutes on each of these, uh, each of these <coughs> authority uh, minutes since he was not present for them. Um, Move to approve the minutes. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. With that one noted uh, exception. Presentation, Housing Authority of the City of Napa Annual Report. Yes, welcome. Thank you. Good evening. Andrea Clark with the Housing Authority for the City of Napa. And I thank you for letting me come here this evening to give you a, I guess I'll do the speed round, <laughs> <laughs> give you an update on the town's housing activities this past year. Go ahead. 
ahead. Yeah. So we're going to uh, review uh, what's been going on with the grants that were awarded to the town um, in the end of 2014 and uh, tell you a little bit about what we've been doing with those and then also then a report on the other housing activities that we do for the town. So first of all, the um, town did receive uh, two grants um, at the end of 2014, uh, and the town received a Cal Home grant in the amount of 330,000 and a home program grant of $500,000. Uh, it took the state a little while to issue those grant contracts, um, but by the um, June 2015, the um, town had executed both contracts. And in this uh, past year, we've been assisting the town with all the uh, contract setup conditions. So each grant had their own uh, contract conditions, setups prior to being able to even access or use any of the funds. So we had to first draft several agreements between the um, town and the housing authority to be the administrators of the grant. And then once we drafted those contracts, then we had to send them to HCD to get them to bless them, and then finally get them back here and everybody sign them. So as the Bureau bureaucracy proceeds it took, takes a little while for all of that to happen and then um, we had to go through some environmental clearances with the um, for the state and the federal aspect of the home grant and then um, issue a request for notice of funding which had to be published we had to do a hearing and um, all that process and then the state finally blessed all of that and then proceeded to um, send the paperwork off to HUD and um, we also then had to draw up some policies and guidelines and then for each of the grants and for and have each of the program representatives uh, bless those for us and then also do applications and loan documents and a lot of setup a lot of setup stuff so I am proud to say that we are now ready to start spending your money so we've already st um, started to do some marketing and outreach um, in October I was asked to go to the uh, Napa Board of Realtors multiple listing service their weekly meeting and they wanted to know everything that was going on in the housing realm um, in the county so I proceeded to let them know that the um, town of Yountville does have a owner occupied rehab program that we were beginning and um, told them all about the program gave them some information and um, when I got back to my office the homeowners association president of one of the mobile home parks had already called me and asked us to come by with flyers so um, we sent out some flyers to the parks and um, we do have four tenants in um, well, I guess they're really homeowners, but they're tenants in one of the parks that um, receive assistance through our Section 8 Rental Assistance Program to pay their space rent. And as one of the federal requirements now for a mobile home, if we're assisting it in any way, they have to have tie-downs so we um, to make sure they don't fall off of their um, foundations during an earthquake and so we identified four of those properties that um, did not have tie downs we've contacted each of those homeowners and and provided them information about how the town might be able to assist them with purchasing and, and um, making those uh, repairs to their homes and then um, We've also, like I said, we've made contact with the mobile home parks, and uh, we hired a rehab specialist just to work for the um, town's program, and she is a licensed contractor. Her name is Cheryl Berkey, so you'll probably see her around here. And um, she's ready to go. She's pretty excited about coming here and working. And um, she already has received four applications. So um, we um, and we'll process those applications. The first thing we do when we receive an application is we have to make sure they're income eligible. So that's where we're at right now is going through the income documentation. So to give you a little background about the grants, um, each of the programs are to provide assistance for owner occupied housing units to be able to make the necessary repairs that need to be done to the units to make them healthy, safe, and sanitary and code compliant. So in the home program, since it is federal dollars that gets 
cycled through the state of California, that is one of the big issues that they want to make sure is that we are covering any code um, issues or any um, safety and health issues. And so in that program, the town has decided to make loans available for a maximum of $58,000 for a single family home and $15,000 for a manufactured home or a mobile home. And they are going to be 30-year uh, deferred payment contracts with the homeowners and at 0% interest rate. And at the end of the 30 years, they would have to pay off those loans or if they sell the home prior to that. And um, under the Cal Home Program grant, um, we can loan up to 58, 000, I'm sorry, $57,500 or $15,000 on the manufactured or mobile home. The same terms on a single family home, the 0% um, interest for 30 years. And then the state wants, um, has um, made a change in the ruling as far as uh, manufactured or mobile homes. And the, the term of that uh, loan will be a 20 year loan, again at 0% interest rate. And then once they are in the home for 10 years or longer, we can start forgiving a portion or one tenth of that uh, amount that they borrowed. And then when we get to year 20, the loan is completely forgiven. So this, um, we have decided that because you've got really two pots of money and kind of different terms for each one, that we'll take the Cal Home money and really zero in on the, any of the mobile homes. Because this is a real benefit to those homeowners then, and especially the seniors that would own these homes and need to have some repairs. And so that's going to be where we're going to um, kind of target those dollars first and then be working on the home grant funds on, in the single family homes. So um, staff has indicated that they identified 10 homes in the um, housing element that they would really like to see. Um, and they've identified that need to have some kind of structural or foundation kind of work done to them. And so those funds will be targeted and um, the home funds will be targeted for those homes. We're going to send some flyers out to those homeowners and see if we can get some interest um, on those. So a little bit about how this loan program works is that, again, we've hired the, the rehabilitation specialist. She's a contractor. She'll work directly with the homeowners. She'll do the intake of the application, make sure they're income eligible, and then also make sure that the repairs that they're requesting are eligible under the program, too. She'll work with the contractors, um, getting bids for the work, and um, walking through the then those bids with the homeowners and the homeowners decide who what contractor they want to work with and um, of course they are encouraged to choose the lowest bid um, and however it is their decision and the contracts are between the homeowner and the contractor and then the loan agreement is between the town and the homeowner and then our um, rehab specialist does work directly with the contractor through the whole phase of the project to make sure um, every scope of the work is being done and funds are not released to the contractor until we know our um, those that work is done correctly and up to code. And then, um, of course, then we, after the uh, project is done, um, after 35 days after the project's done, we would release any retingency funds that would be in the um, loan to the um, contractor, and the contractor would we'd file a notice of completion. So that's sort of the quick and dirty of the uh, process. So as part of our contract with the town, we will provide, um, like I said, the application services, the intake, the contractor, and then where I come in, I'm going to be working on the reporting and the financial side of it. And um, each of these grant programs do require quarterly reporting, which we've already been doing, even though we haven't had any real activity to re um, to report to them. And they also have annual reporting, so those will all be done and sent into um, the state on behalf of the town, and then. And um, we will be um, keeping the contract file, the work file, and then also the loan file um, for the town. The original loan documents, however, will be kept here. And, um, and then uh, the finance department would keep their own set of ledgers for each of the grants. And, um, and then as 
we'll, as we make the loans and on an annual basis, we will go back and recertify with each of the homeowners that they still are remaining owner occupants because these programs are designed to assist owner occupants, not rental properties. And um, if they want to turn them into rental properties at any point, um, they would have to pay off the town's loan. So that's going to be part of our monitoring process to make sure that they um, remain owner occupied and that their taxes are property taxes are kept current and their um, homeowners insurance is kept current. And with mobile homes, we'll make sure that their um, registration with HCD remains current. So that's all going to be part of that um, administration of the grant and the loan servicing side of the grant. And so we have um, executed contracts with the town to administer those. And then as new funds become available, of course, we would see if the town wants to apply for new funds. Um, so um, I put this chart up here so you can see what income level that we um, these grants are and this loan program is actually targeting. So um, this is 80%. Um, this is a chart showing you the 80% of median income level or low income. So a household of one, their income could not their gross annual income could not be more than 48,900 for a family of two, 55, 850, and so on. So um, I think with most of the seniors and most of the homeowners, we're going to be in that two to four person um, household range. So um, again, we look at what their income is that they make today and then project that a year forward. And um, there are lots of uh, different rules and regulations that the program has that tells us then how we look at income and assets. Um, people are not penalized for having assets. However, they're encouraged to use their own assets. Um, so um, we run into that with seniors that are actually trying to live on their assets. So they're not penalized for having those assets. However, any income that they would receive from those assets, that's counted uh, along with their annual income. Okay. So next slide. Um, so I think I went over some of the marketing things already. And um, again, we're really excited to be able to start launching this program. You can go to the next slide. And so I went through that. I think you were a couple slides behind me there. So, and to then, um, as far as um, our, um, yep, I, we've done that one too. So, <laughs> I guess I was doing too too much of the speed version for you there. Um, so, what we do for you on in our standard uh, um, housing services contract is we monitor and look at those affordable housing units, so the for sale units or the rental units that the town has regulatory agreements on. So as far as the um, for sale units or the owner occupied units, we um, send them an annual self certification each year asking them to um, verify that they are still owner occupying the property. We make sure that their um, property tax Taxes are being paid. We make sure that they they are carrying sufficient amount of homeowners insurance, um, you know, coverage on the property. And then the other um, aspect is we do provide some loan servicing with regards to if um, uh, the homes they uh, they're price restricted um, for whatever term of the contract is with the um, town. And so then um, occasionally I will get homeowners interested in maybe selling their property. Property, and so they will contact me and ask me what is the current restricted sale price. And so I've um, had actually several inquiries this year, nobody really wanting to sell yet, but I've had some inquiries. So I think people are kind of looking at the market, seeing what's going on, and trying to judge then, well, how much is my restricted unit um, worth? And so then on the rental side of it, um, we kind of do the same thing, but we contact the property managers and have them verify to us that they are renting the units um, at the appropriate you know, rent levels and also renting them to um, the appropriate income levels. And um, so as they are getting new tenants, they are having to income certify everybody and then also um, adjust their rents accordingly. So this past year, we've actually had some turnover in um, Girardi Place, Hopper Creek, and Vineyard Oaks. And so we've provided some technical assistance to them as far as making sure that they are um, doing the income certification 
properly and also making sure that they're doing some marketing locally. Um, I had a had a, just recently uh, Jay Ryder from Vineyard Oaks was indicating that he had a unit available, a uh, two-bedroom unit, and he was having a hard time renting it. And so I had asked him, well, had he contacted the local restaurants? And, and um, he said no. And I said, well, perhaps maybe he should do that. Because that, that was really that unit um, at a moderate rate income. So a household of one, maybe 72300 is the maximum income. He shouldn't have any trouble reaching out to some of our, your service workers to be able to rent that unit. So um, he said he was going to do a little more outreach. So, um, anyway, he does have a two-bedroom unit, if anybody's listening, and it's going to rent at $17.95 a month, and the tenant would be paying all the utilities. And um, I think that wraps it up for my report this evening. Great. Thank you very much. Questions <coughs> from the council? I have one Vice Mayor? Um, yes, thank you for the presentation. Um, I know you mentioned <clears throat> that one of the services you provide us is in ensuring and supporting uh, people who are in these affordable income uh, or low income affordable housing units and given that there's been the current switch or swing in the housing market in Yonville, um, are we confident or do we have process in place where we're going to ensure that should some of these units be uh, intended for sale that they're going to be able to hold and retain and restrict those covenants because I know historically there have been some challenges with ensuring that those are entitled and properly listed on uh, loan docs as far as when a new tenant comes in that they're aware of the encumbrances associated with that. How are we dealing with that process? <clears throat> well, we went back through and um, I think those were more of the issue with the ownership units and it had to do with um, some of the financing and some of the um, predatory financing that was going on. Um, so we did go through all of the homeowner units and make sure that we had um, current notices recorded so that any kind of foreclosure action that would happen, the town would be notified. And then you could only hope that when the title company is doing their preliminary title searches, if somebody is selling their property, that um, they do pick up these affordable housing agreements. They're all recorded against the properties, and so, um, you know, we from time to time we go through and just look at the county records and see if there's been any kind of documents changing hands with some of the owners of the properties. That's really about the best we can do, except for you know personal contact and making sure everybody knows that yes, you still have that agreement with the town, and if you want to sell your property, you need to let us know that type of thing. So. Um, you know, that's, that's about it. Okay. Yeah. We're feeling pretty confident that there isn't the, the predatory lending going on that um, went on, you know, 10 years ago. And, and um, uh, however, that adjustable rate mortgage is being spoken out there in the world again, and that's kind of scary. <coughs> yeah. Okay. Just one <coughs> comment, Andrew, <Andrea, coughs> excuse me, realized when we were talking about We've talked a little bit about as we start generating a bit more funding back into our housing opportunity fund that one of the objectives that the council may want to consider is uh, purchasing when some of these affordable deed restricted units come up because then we could put them back into the rental market. So I just want to share we're building some of that up and um, it's something that has been expressed by the council. The housing opportunity fund balance is still relatively low because uh, we actually built a lot of units in the last five years so it'll be a while before we build it back up but that was one of our thoughts is that as we get a few new things coming in that that could be a target because the town has the right of first refusal on all of our deed restricted for sale home ownership property. Great. I did have one other question if I could ask go, going back to your is it a rehab specialist or whatever the, the title was uh, do they does that person pre-qualify the subcontractors that are then presented to the homeowners so the homeowner feels can feel confident that they are legit with their um, bidding and, and quality work and all that 
So we have, we will, part of this outreach we're going to be doing is with some of the local contractors to let them know that the program is available and that we would entertain um, bids from them when we are um, <coughs> going to have different jobs um, available. In that process of them signing up with us, we do go back and check to make sure that they are licensed one with the state of California that they do have a business license with the local entity and that they are not on the federal debarment list and so that is um, one of the big requirements of both grant grant programs that we have to check that we have to document that and have a, uh, a file for each of them and um, so yes as we go through the bidding process we um, advertise we have a bid hotline on the housing authority um, web page so we know and on our phone system um, and local contractors know about this um, and we um, then advertise if we are going to have any kind of projects that are coming up and we do a, what's called a bid walk and walk the contractors through tell them the scope of work and then tell them when the bids um, are due and um, so yeah we do a very thorough check on them and we have a handful of contractors that like to work with us because they know they get you know they are um, we're required to pay them the um, federal dollar you know the federal wage so you know they like that because they know they're going to make a good wage on the project they know they're going to get paid so um, yeah I want to go back um, Mr. Hall and, and address your other question with regards to how are we making sure um, that these units aren't being turned over um, well when they have turned over because we've had some that have turned over um, the uh, town adopted some new um, documentation so not only do we have a regulatory agreement that we require Record. we also record a deed of trust and it's a no money deed of trust because you're not lending them any monies but it is a deed of trust to help the title companies actually see those documents and then it refers them back to the regulatory agreement so that seems to be one of the markers that the title companies have told us that they that when they do a quick search they're looking for deeds of trust they're not looking for regulatory agreements or first option to purchase agreements or any of those other creative titles that we've put on these documents over the years um, but I can tell you that our local title uh, managers are very aware of the program the the tax assessor's office is so anytime there's any kind of activity boy they're on the phone to me and go okay did it sell at a restricted price do I have to assess it at that restricted price so yeah okay thank you you're welcome thank you for the report you're welcome thank you I see that we have no other business uh, for the Housing Authority so I will go ahead and uh, adjourn from the outfill Housing Authority <coughs> and I will convene the Yonville Finance Authority special meeting for January 19 and recognize that all officers are present uh, offering public comment on this authority seeing none election of officers uh, if there is a motion for the mayor to be elected chair and the vice mayor to be vice chair so moved thank you and a second was that councilmember Moeller mm -hmm. sure I'll second it mm -hmm. all in favor aye, aye. thank you uh, to consent items, we will again uh, recognize the abstain vote from Councilmember Durham on the minutes. So consent 5A. Is there a motion for the consent calendar? I'll move for the cons uh, consent calendar. I'll second. Thank you. All in favor? <coughs> Aye. Aye. And I believe that's it for our business uh, with the Yonville Finance Authority. So I will adjourn that special meeting. <coughs> and we will convene the special meeting for the Yonville Parking Authority. Again, recognizing all officers are present, uh, inviting public comment, seeing none. Uh, again, election of the officers, uh, uh, I would propose a motion of mayor. Well, I shouldn't propose the motion, but is there a motion for uh, chair being the mayor and vice chair being the vice mayor? So moved. Second. I guess you can make it. Uh, motion by Vice Mayor Hall, seconded by Councilmember Muller. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Consent item. We have two uh, calendar. We have two items. Is there a motion for approval? So moved. Second. Thank you. Uh, all in favor? I know we'll have an abstention from Councilmember Durham on item A, but uh, all in favor for item uh, B? Aye. 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 
And then let's go back to item A. Uh, all in favor of consent calendar item A? Aye. 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 And Aye. Uh, no opposed, but one abstention for Councilmember Durham. I believe that's all of our business for the parking authority, so we will adjourn from that special meeting and reconvene our regular <laughs> Yalfell Town Council meeting for January 19. And we will get back to our public comment if there's anything for the council to hear on public comment. Seeing none, we're going to move on to our one consent calendar item, which is receive and file monthly financial reports from December 2015. Is there a motion on that item? I'll move to approve the consent calendar. I'll second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 No opposed. Moving right along. So now we are going, going to go to our first presentation, which uh, is going to be from CAL FIRE. Uh, it'll be our uh, quarterly report. Welcome back. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Dunbar and uh, Council members. I'm Steve Hawks, the Battalion Chief for Cal Fire and Napa County Fire here in Yauntville. Before I go into the quarterly report, I'd just like to make mention that we had a very large uh, eucalyptus tree come down here at 4.30 this afternoon and fell uh, completely across Solano Avenue about 100 yards south of town. So we're working with uh, county roads to uh, clear that tree uh, but it's really large. It's going to take a while. It's probably going to be a couple more hours before we have the road completely open. So if um, residents are out there, please avoid Solano between Hoffman and uh, the uh, basically the fire station on uh, Solano there for the next couple hours. So they're not uh, traffic is not being allowed to turn on to, on to Solano from California? It, it is to be able to get into the golf course okay. area, but we have it blocked uh, basically at the, at the second entrance into the golf course. And residents that need to get access to Vineyard View Drive or just if they can prove their residency? They can still get in, Okay, yes. great. Thank the uh, blockage is just south of that. Right. Okay, uh, so moving into the uh, quarterly report for quarter four of 2015, uh, we ran a, a total of 297 medical aid calls out of our uh, 402 calls that the station ran for the year. So um, it's no coincidence that medical aids continue to be the highest number of calls that uh, we and most fire departments throughout the country run. Um, of those, uh, 96 of the calls were within the town limits. <clears throat> Some uh, major events that we participated in for the quarter was, uh, or let me back up, um, we responded to a couple structure fires. Uh, one was up just uh, north of the city of St. Helena limits, and we had one just south of the Wooden Valley uh, School on Wooden Valley Road. And um, the, the one up in St. Helena, we were able to make quick response due to the location near our St. Helena fire station and uh, basically contain the fire to uh, the size it was when they first arrived at scene, although it still uh, received a lot of damage from the fire as well as smoke damage throughout the house. The one um, on Wooden Valley Crossroad was almost fully involved when the first uh, fire unit arrived at scene and so that was the complete loss to that structure and it, then it extended into a, a large roughly 8,000 square foot barn with uh, tractors and, and a couple vehicles inside and that was a uh, complete loss as well. Uh, we also had a uh, major injury uh, vehicle accident out here on uh, Silverado Trail that had uh, Silverado Trail shut down for a couple hours and uh, during high traffic uh, time, and you can imagine the havoc that that wreaked with uh, traffic. Um, events that we participated in were Yauntville Days, uh, the Breast Cancer 5K Run, uh, Annual Tree Lighting Ceremony, and a Festival of Lights. We also held our, as we do every year, our what we call the Napa County uh, uh, Chiefs and Firefighter of the Year dinner at our Yauntville station. And each of our nine volunteer fire companies uh, are able to honor uh, one of their members uh, for their outstanding commitment and service to their, their area that they serve. And uh, we also honored one of our um, career personnel for outstanding service for the year. So we were honored uh, once again to host that dinner. Um, this year we hosted our toy drive and uh, we, we think it was another success and we really appreciate the uh, commitment from the community to help us with that because we couldn't do it without all, everyone's support. 
So we appreciate that and look forward to next year. Um, we recently, it's probably been two or three months ago, um, purchased a Lucas device and uh, we carry it on our engine 12 here at Yauntville Station. We, we purchased two of them for Napa County Fire, one's out in Capel um, because of the remoteness. But also the, the second one is here on our engine 12 and a Lucas, Lucas device um, provides um, chest compressions during a CPR call and it provides um, good depth and uh, interval of chest compressions and does better than what um, you know average firefighter can do. Um, so we're, we're happy to have that and it's a good part of our uh, uh, equipment now that we carry on engine 12 and I think it'll be a good benefit to uh, here Yauntville community. The safety message for this quarter is uh, El Nino is here, thankfully. Uh, we're getting a lot of good rain, starting to fill up our local reservoirs, and we're appreciative of that. Um, but just remember that uh, with the rain comes uh, really slick roads, so be careful driving out there. Always wear your seatbelt. And uh, uh, never drive through flooded roadways. Um, as we learn in our uh, training with Swift Water Rescue, uh, water is relentless and powerful and you never know what it could do to a surface that's underneath the roadway. Um, so it may not always be there. So don't assume that the roadway is always there. It's better just to avoid driving through uh, flooded roadways. So uh, that's it for the quarterly report. Any questions? Questions of the report? No. Thank no, thank you very much. And, and I also would assume that if... I think we have a break in the storm right now, so there, this may not be an issue, but with uh, residents that were maybe trying to get to our courtyard to get sandbag uh, filling with the tree down, they were, they're were they just going to be turned away? Let me clarify one thing. Residents do not go to the courtyard to get sandbags. The sandbag okay. station is located oh, that's right. that's at right. Yountville Community Park. It's been operating. Um, has been in place now for about 10 days, continues to be staffed. So I'm glad I brought it up. It's, that is a, a very good thing <laughs> because we really don't want to encourage people to go through one of the lowest lying areas subject to flooding to get their sandbags. It's sort of a oxymoron. So we've changed that. And I would also point out we have a great partnership with the County of Napa and their Public Works Department. And we jointly set up that station right there at... Uh, Grant and um, Washington at the very north end there at the town by the cemetery. So it's a really accessible location. Um, you are required to bring your own labor. Um, the bags are there and we periodically re replenish both bags and sand as needed. Okay. And we did have uh, with the this morning's rain, uh, I guess on Hopper Creek there at Oak Circle was a little bit of water come out into the roadway. I drove by a little after 8 o'clock this morning just to check it out, and then the next little report came out uh, 11 o'clock-ish, and it just shows how quickly that the, the creeks can rise and equally as fast recede. So just be careful out there. Yes. Thank you very much. I Thank appreciate you. appreciate the report. <coughs> next up, we are going to have our sheriff's quarterly report. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, so before we get started, I, I thought I would mention something. Um, I was speaking with a certain sheriff's captain who used to be a sheriff's sergeant that used to work here. I won't mention his name, but he's quite a bit smaller than I am and a little bit older. Uh, but he was telling me that he also had to do a quarterly presentation kind of just after he got here. And he discovered at some point that uh, he felt it was one of his duties and not a responsibility to to uh, make fireman jokes. <laughs> so uh, he didn't tell me that was my job or anything like that, but he thought I, I needed to know. But uh, I figured since it's my first you know, go, and, and quite frankly, I wasn't sure who was going first and who was going second, maybe I would just hold off this time. Maybe we'll make some jokes next time. But uh, anyway. We do, we do tend to rotate who goes first and second, just well, to warn you. In, uh, thank you. Tactically, I'll For that very reason. Mind. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's good to know. Thanks yeah. for the information. Um, so also, obviously, uh, we've got a bit of a change in the guards with the Sheriff's Department here. And uh, with that in mind, doing the quarterly report, I had a lot of conversations with different people about the statistics and what they're showing and what they mean. And, and really, quite frankly, for me, they didn't have a lot of meaning because I didn't have a lot of background. I mean, I've worked for the Sheriff's Department for almost 20 years. 
never been assigned here. And while I'm aware of it, you know, peripherally, obviously, uh, um, having worked, like I said, here for a long time, um, I thought it'd be interesting to do kind of a five-year analysis just to see where things have been and where we're going and, and um, whether the concerns are the same or different or whatever. So with that in mind, um, I guess we'll start with uh, to basically our community activities this quarter. Um, it's no slide for it, but essentially we had Festival of Lights and the Yachtville Days Parade. Again, I, I wasn't here to participate. From my understanding, there were some changes in the way the, the Festival of Lights was laid out, and it made things much more smooth from a public safety perspective. So kudos to whoever uh, was responsible for that. There were no real, real uh, events of note as far as we're concerned. No real disturbances or arrests were made during those things. Uh, we start with the slides. Uh, you can see Yonville's a great place to live. There's basically a non-existent uh, violent crime right here. We have zero homicides, zero rapes, zero robberies throughout the year. We did have two assaults with weapons, uh, 20 simple assaults, which would be, you know, basically your minor scuffles, batteries, that sort of thing, and three cases of domestic violence annually. Uh, if we could get the next slide. And then we move on to the property crimes. Again, uh, fairly low. We did have kind of an interesting side note. Um, well, I guess I'll get to that in a second, but you'll, you'll see the burglaries, uh, residential, we had four, uh, other meaning um, a, a business or some other place of that nature. Uh, so Prop 47s were all were passed in 2014, the end of 2014, and, and one of the major effects that had on law enforcement was it, it changed a lot of what were pre previously either a wobbler, which means to be charged as a misdemeanor or a felony, or straight felonies to misdemeanors. And one of the effects it has was it changed the limit. It used to be to, to commit a felony theft, you had to steal more than $400. Now you have to steal more than 950 So you would think that looking at the statistics, you would expect that there would be a higher number of petty thefts if things were to remain equal. But you can see uh, this year we had uh, 22 grand thefts, which was more than the petty thefts of 13. So kind of interesting. I guess I have a theory on why that is. We'll get to that in a few slides, but I just thought it was kind of an interesting side note. Um, anecdotally, many people will believe, and, and it could just be the Yonville is such an anomaly, uh, being a, the, uh, such a small, tight-knit community um, with a high visitor population that the statistics maybe don't hold true as they might in a larger population. But um, I thought that was kind of interesting. So moving on, three grand thefts, uh, eight cases of vandalism annually. Again, um, fairly low numbers, I would think. Uh, annually this year, we had 3,430 calls for service. We uh, prepared 192 uh, criminal investigation reports. Um, 34 arrests were made, 14 uh, misdemeanor citations, 156 traffic citations, 550 parking citations. Uh, again, historically, the two main concerns in Yachtville, which good or bad, depending on how you look at it, are historically traffic and parking. So. It's reflective in the statistics, obviously. As far as the collisions go, uh, it was pointed out to me that our numbers are a little bit different than the firemen because they have sort of a report for every collision they go to, whereas we don't. Uh, we only write reports, um, generally speaking, on injury or, or excuse me, uh, yeah, minor injury to, to injuries. Sometimes we'll write them on the non-injuries, but not as often. Oftentimes it can be uh, accomplished just with an exchange of information between drivers. We'll facilitate that, um, help them get on their way quicker. Um, and you can see we had no fatal collisions this year. So uh, officer initiated activity for this quarter. Um, you can see the different breakdowns between uh, sheriff's department activity, meaning deputies that are assigned to Valley Patrol that may be operating within the town of Yonville for one reason or another, as well as uh, your Yonville assigned personnel. A total amount of what we call traffic stops just self-explanatory pedestrian checks, meaning uh, for some reason someone's drawn our attention, so we stop to talk to them. Uh, patrol checks, meaning, uh, you know, it's sort of what it sounds like. You're just checking an area, look, seeing if there's anything of note. Um, vehicle checks, again, relates to a suspicious vehicle, whether, uh, generally speaking in this case, what a deputy might notice, something out of the ordinary. And then parking issues. Uh, you can see there's 221 total calls for that. As far as traffic stops go this quarter, we had 75 total stops, uh, 51 warnings were issued, 24 citations. So a uh, five-year overview of the crimes against property. I uh, went back to 2011, so including 2015, it's a total span of five years. Um, burglary residentials, we averaged six 
um, others, seven, petty theft, 19, theft, grand, 14, uh, auto, three, and vandalism, eight. And you can see realistically the numbers stay more or less the same. There's some variations from year to year. Uh, we get spikes, but that's just the cyclical nature of the business, uh, as in any business. You know, some, some things happen more often in some years than others. Uh, moving to the next slide. Um, this would show essentially the percentage of uh, property crimes reported in 2015 against the five year average. In other words, if, if for instance, burglary, other, the, the average was eight, uh, and this year we had, say, three, then, that, then it would be a 40% of average. Um, the only place, again, where you see a, a spike really is, um, at least in the positive or negative direction, depending on how you look at it, is the grand theft, 160% of average, kind of high. Um, burglaries down, petty thefts down, and um, auto theft and vandalism pretty much equal. Yeah. Uh, crimes against persons, again, great town to live, great town to visit. Average uh, violent crime is basically non existent um, with the occasional. Uh, ballyhoo. Um, assaults with weapons, average two over the five years. Simple assaults, an average of 17. Domestic violence, an average of three. And again, you can see that um, the averages more or less stay fairly stagnant. Um, next slide. So against the five-year average, the only thing that we're really up on is simple assaults. Um, but again, uh, with the pool being kind of as small as it is, it's really hard to be too overly concerned about it uh, when you go from you know four assaults to five assaults it's, it's a pretty significant increase statistically but while it's important to the people involved from a greater perspective perhaps not quite as uh, as telling next slide uh, <clears throat> calls for service so an average of about 3138 over the five years uh, about 189 reports 35 arrests 18 misdemeanor citations 112 traffic citations and 441 parking citations um, what you'll notice is uh, calls for service were up this year. Reports were basically average. Arrests, more or less average, a little down. Uh, where we're up the most significantly is in uh, traffic citations and parking citations over the average. And actually, that's going back a couple years. Uh, uh, 2014 was also higher as well. Traffic collisions, again, basically the same. Um, the average of 13. Uh, non-injury this year was was 15 um, injury accidents three that was the average this year was three and no <coughs> fatalities uh, so again non-injuries were up maybe 115 percent of uh, average and uh, injuries are, are uh, the same 100 percent of average <coughs> officer initiated activities um, average traffic stops 370 what's interesting is is um, that tends to fluctuate a bit but that was basically the, we're a little higher than average this year. Uh, pedestrian checks about 24, patrol checks 328, vehicle checks 37, and parking issues 307. Um, it's what's interesting about the parking is you'll notice probably significantly a, a dramatic increase over the last five years. Um, part of that has to do with uh, we have a volunteer that writes parking citations. He's enthusiastic about it <laughs> uh, and uh, I think the deputies also have probably increased their activity a bit in that regard um, so traffic stops again a little higher than the average and again I mentioned the vehicle checks and parking issues uh, parking is about 137 percent of average um, for the five years so um, other than that uh, we've had um, Six cars, as far as the abatement program goes, we marked six cars for towing. Of those, we gained voluntary compliance with, uh, from five. We ended up towing one, which is a pretty kind of the point of the whole thing, right? To get people to take responsibility for their own front yards, if you will. Um, and then the highlighted cases this quarter um, really uh, have to do with a serial thief. And it, it's kind of a funny term because it brings to mind someone stealing Cheerios, but clearly not the case. Uh, and, and well, someone it might be called a burglary. Technically, what this is where the grand theft spike comes from. So uh, I mentioned I mentioned earlier, obviously, that the grand thefts are higher than the petty thefts. And I think realistically, where that came from was we had this series of uh, grand thefts from vehicles, which might normally be reported as a burglary. But the interesting thing about Yonville is people feel so safe here is nobody locks anything. 
So it can't be a burglary if the doors aren't locked. Has to, it's classified as a theft, although the, the end result is the same, uh, more or less. People are losing stuff because they're not locking their doors, which, um, you know, we're not here to judge anyone for how they choose to live their lifestyle. If, if that's the way you want to do it, that's fine. But we, we should be aware that while Yachtville is, is a great place to live and the crime, light is, the crime rate is low and, and there's lots of great people living and coming through town occasionally, uh, what happens is someone comes through town who realizes this and uh, capitalizes on it. And um, hopefully some people will start locking things. And if not, that's okay too. We're here to help and uh, do what we can. Any questions? Questions about the report? Councilmember Durham? Um, in, in the report we received as well, there was a, a statement about the volunteer. Yes. I, is that still active or what's the status of that? Uh, we do still have a volunteer. Um, he is on sort of a hiatus uh, for some personal reasons and we expect him back in about six weeks. Okay. Is there, is there a set schedule time program that he's on besides my car? <laughs> That's an excellent question that I'd love to answer for you. Uh, but yeah, he actually hasn't. He actually hasn't um, been working since I've been here. Okay. So what his fixed schedule is, I don't know. I know that he works about forty hours a month. Uh, and I partially joke, only partially, but um, <laughs> only because of the fact that um, what I see, I. I, I get up early in the morning to head to nap and come back, So and that's when a lot of the business um, deliveries are happening during the day, mm -hmm. which seems to be, a, in my personal opinion, a, a safety issue in terms of people accessing, um, getting on the highway um, at, the north, at the north end of town, okay. um, and being able to navigate down the street with the big delivery trucks and stuff. Right. So that's, that's my inquiry about the... Uh, about the scheduled hours that that okay. person uh, works. Yeah, he doesn't work uh, terribly early. He's retired. Okay. So, uh, and honestly, I'm not certain what time he comes in. I think it's probably later morning or uh, noonish. No way. And um, it might be better that we don't drill down too closely on exactly when. Uh, no, which which is <laughs> fine. Control and, is happening. And I paid, I paid one of the tickets actually, but um, <laughs> the other was forgiven. Um, legally so um, I, I just uh, my statement is that if if possible there's there should be some focus on that issue during those early mornings as sure. well because it is a busy time in this town especially right. during the summertime right. uh, with all the deliveries so yeah, one of the one of the things we're faced with is the balance between commerce and the structure of this of the town mm -hmm. you know it's it's old world in the sense that the streets are narrow and um, there's not much shoulder, which, you know, much to the chagrin of those that would like to have electric vehicles uh, in their own lanes. There just isn't any room. Secondarily, the problem with that is maneuvering vehicles that are delivery trucks and whatnot around the town is, is somewhat difficult. So, uh, obviously, I'm, I'm open to suggestion and direction. The, the issue becomes someone has to make a delivery to, um, well, I don't want to name any businesses, but let's just say a business on Washington Street where there isn't really any access on the side or the back. Uh, I have noticed, for instance, delivery trucks parking in the parking lot of the V Marketplace and, and walking across, which I think is a great idea, but that opportunity is not always available. So then the question becomes, how do we address that situation uh, in an equitable manner and still have commerce come forward and, and move on and that sort of thing? And, and I, I agree. And I'm I, not dismissing the safety issue at all. I understand completely. Uh, I just want to see if we can have that discussion in the future then. Sure. Well, That's absolutely. great. A couple things. Um, what I would encourage any of you when you see a circumstance or a resident, uh, either let myself or John know, uh, John and I communicate fairly often regularly. We share information because uh, uh, it's always helpful because some people see something differently at a point in time. Because what I would say, the area that you're targeting, uh, Council Member Durham, is probably never would have been really under the jurisdiction of what the volunteer would have likely uncovered and managed because um, that person is really looking more at the more structured parking and what you're really talking about is commercial driver behavior. And actually I have a short list as part of our orientation to go with unknown locations and rough timing. So I really would encourage some of you that have that because in many cases ours are targeted and certain things that we might do with a commercial driver are very different than the occasional residential or visitor parking because in many cases a commercial driver has options, should know better, 
gets lazy and chooses not to and what we just need to do is have a periodic opportunity to remind them that when they're in Yountville they need to do what they need to do properly. Um, so that's kind of our philosophy. So um, I'd be curious as to what all you might have and I'll add it to the short list that we have. Thank you. And, and adding, adding to that too, if you do happen to see something in the early morning hours that's particularly egregious or causes you some safety concerns, I would encourage you to call uh, Call dispatch and uh, have a deputy sent out to Thank investigate you. if Thank you very if much. there aren't anybody uh, on duty here at the time. Councilmember Dornbeck. Uh, yes, I just I was aware of the serial robberies of cars. I was just wondering if the perpetrator had been um, arrested and. Well, that's an interesting question. Um, sometimes in law enforcement, when especially with serial thieves or serial perpetrators of other kinds. They do get arrested, and the crimes stop, and it's not necessarily because we arrested them. Uh, they just happen to be in custody somewhere else for something else they got caught for. Uh, in this particular case, there was a person of interest that was arrested in a different jurisdiction um, for a related instance, you might say. Um, however, there were some of the activity continued after that. So it could have been more than one person. However, that does it has seemed to have stopped for whatever reason. Whether someone got arrested somewhere, uh, we just don't realize that they were the person that was responsible. Um, you know, hard to say. But uh, to answer the question more directly, I guess is anyway being prosecuted for those thefts, not to my knowledge. Thank you. Certainly. Any other questions? Just a comment. <clears throat> Vice Mayor. Thanks for the report and sure. the five-year look back. It's always, you know, it's healthy to kind of look at the average of how things have gone. And I think we're really fortunate, as you indicate, in this community. But uh, you can never take things for granted. So you got to lock your car and, and park in your parking spot. Absolutely. 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 And, okay. and I appreciate that as well. One of the things that you highlighted, though, is our statistics can skew fairly significantly without the data really backing that up and right. so it's kind of important to be recognizing that but I agree that the, looking back at trends really helps us put into context what the numbers really mean so thank sure. you for that Just absolutely my pleasure one question sergeant Crawford before you go is could you share on uh, the role of surveillance camera and some of the video capturing that you may have been able to use in the investigations and how if that played any role in your ability to uh, move forward on a few of the cases <clears throat> Absolutely. I mean, uh, a, a good portion of my career was spent in our investigative unit, both as a detective and uh, as the sergeant supervising the unit. And I, I, we've solved many cases uh, based on on uh, video, or at least in part based on video. It's, it's very helpful in identifying suspects. Um, in fact, uh, if you recall the Manny Reyes murder uh, from years ago, um, we were able to get his suspect's uh, picture from video of uh, a uh, market in Napa. So uh, more recently, we were, again, able to get surveillance video of a suspect who had stolen a couple of wallets from a local restaurant and um, was seen making purchases in a local establishment in Napa on video. And because of that, he'll be prosecuted. And we were able to identify him not only identify, uh, excuse me, to identify him, but also prove elements of the crime in that we could see swiping the credit card that wasn't his, the color of the credit card that wasn't his, which matched the victim's card, uh, signing the um, electronic, I don't even know what they call it, but the little electric, electronic thing at the, at the cash register. So very helpful. Um, and there's certainly been other time, times as well where uh, would they have the, what they call the LPR style of cameras, which is a license plate reader, um, particularly in a town like Yawville, it basically has three points of ingress and egress. You could really collect a lot of data, not necessarily from the law enforcement perspective, maybe it'd be a town, more of a town um, collection, obviously accessible by the Sheriff's Department or the law enforcement. And if you nail down the general time frame, especially in a place like Yonville, where there's not a lot moving after midnight, um, you could really get a good idea of who might be responsible for something that happened, like I say, especially in early morning hours, which is when a lot of this stuff tends to happen. Very good. Yeah, Thank you very much. Certainly. Appreciate it. We are going to move on to our third presentation, which is kind of a fun one for us. Uh, it's going to highlight the relationship that the town of Yonville has developed with the city of Rancho Cucamonga. And I believe we're going to start with an introduction from uh, Steve actually, and then uh, a video. Very quickly, what I, um, our team was down for some training in early December and um, 
they kept encouraging us to make sure we were going to the council meeting and uh, we weren't quite sure why. Um, now, some of you may find it surprising that I was willing to go to a council meeting because I'm sort <laughs> of a council meeting junkie. But really, on what was really quite nice is um, the, the city of Rancho Cucamonga City Council presented the town with a proclamation and uh, we're going to show you the presentation and it really was a surprise to us and it's in part of their efforts for what has been one of the more uh, we think innovative and creative partnerships and and certainly from my perspective and I'll you'll hear me say it it should have been the other way around because we've benefited incredibly from this relationship and what you're going to find is that that council and that community and their team feels equally strong so with that that's probably a good segue <coughs> successful years with a number of clients, but um, we've never forgotten um, who our first uh, and most important client was that we started with, and that was the town of Yountville. And so we wanted to recognize them tonight, and I wanted to turn it over to Ingrid to say a little bit more about the work with them. Thank you, Mr. Gittleson. City, the town of Yountville, I'm so sorry, I get town. Yeah. <laughs> the town of Yandrell. Um, it has been really um, a rewarding uh, process for the shared services that we do. We met this um, wonderful staff, this, the town manager Steve Rogers, and they just welcomed us. We, um, as as um, Mr. Gilson alluded to. They were our first customer, so we were in a learning mode as they were learning also because this is the first venture that we had undertaken, but they were so warm and welcoming. And as we collaborated and put our heads together, we were able to implement their GIS and and I, I guess we did a really good job because two years later we still have the contract and we're continuing on. And here they are tonight. So we are very, very um, appreciative of the, the welcome we've received. We, we love working with them. And um, we look forward to doing so much more in the future with them so that they can grow their GIS. And, and now they're recognized because they won um, the prestigious award. And, and, um, and they've, now they're on the map and going places, very different places as they move forward each day. So thank you so much, Steve, and um, thank your mayor and city council for us, for accepting us, for trusting us that we could come in and do this work. Thank you. Would you like to say a few words, Steve? <laughs> I would. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> our town council and our staff, including all of those that you've worked with on the first phase, um, frankly, it's humbling for you to be thanking us because in all honesty, the, the thanks goes to Mayor Michael, your council, uh, your management team, and all of your staff that do it. And, and more importantly, the broader Rancho Cucamonga team, because I think your innovative, your support, really has created a, a, a tremendous model for shared services that should be looked at more. Uh, our team learns and grows more from your team, whether it's the crews and public works, uh, looking at how we're out in the field. We have so much more in common, even though our scale may be very different, but this is just an incredibly rewarding experience. And, and frankly, it, it's been, I think, incredibly positive and, and one that we look forward to continuing. And I joked with you earlier saying, we have several years worth of work and we're just getting warmed up. So <laughs> again, on behalf of everybody, thank you so much. Well, you're more than welcome. But I think, you know, as you, as you make that, the problem is I have to say that I would when, without question we know on this council that the staff that work with you learn just as much from you and and came up with new ideas for, for us and for our future partnerships that we may have but more importantly um, I, I think you hit it on the that when you can have a public agency public agency partnerships whether it be public public or public private to, to allow uh, uh, your organization to flourish 
uh, where maybe you weren't before as far as GIS went, uh, we're going to take a little bit of that because we've got a great team here. This gentleman down here, Solomon, is, is, the, is an incredible gift for GIS information under the leadership of Ingrid, and the whole team in that department is just incredible. So uh, I have this proclamation I would like to present to you in your city, or your town, excuse me, there's a town of Apple Valley in this in this in this county, and believe me, when you said the city of Apple Valley, let me let you know, you know it's not a city; it's a town. So I apologize for that. Whereas the Rancho Cucamonga Enterprise Geographic Information Systems Connect Regis Connect of the City of Rancho Cucamonga. Kumanga, has entered into a professional services agreement with the town of Yountville, located in the county of Napa for GIS shared services, and whereas the town of Yountville is the first customer for Regis Connect having signed of the agreement in February 19, 2014, and still remaining in effect, and whereas Regis Connect has completed the first phase of the GIS implementation and progress to the second phase, which was the design and development of a mobile app for residents and visitors to encourage more involvement in the community that they love. And whereas this app was entered into the 2015 International City County Management ICMA App Challenge Competition, and whereas on October 28, 2015, the town of Yountville was awarded second place for their MyVille application. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that the City Council of the City of Rancho Cucamonga does hereby congratulate the town of Yountville for this very prestigious recognition and also expresses their appreciation and our appreciation for being the first entity to partner with Regis Connect and lead the way for others to follow. And I want to especially thank you for taking the trip down to Southern California from the beautiful Napa Valley. In fact, uh, some of us would like to go back with you. Uh, but uh, no, in all sincerity, uh, thank you so much and thank you for all coming down and, and may uh, you have many, many years of great success. And it looks like we'll need to uh, understand our uh, <clears throat> internet bandwidth speed capacity to, to see why we seem to be having a slow, I don't know if that's weather related or Cam Comcast related, but we will certainly try to figure out why that wasn't running at regular speed. Uh, with that, I do think um, in a bit of irony, we actually have, um, uh, um, Regis will be up here the balance of the week and we've got uh, training going on for our employees. We're, we're launching phase two, which is going to include uh, a broader utilization across all levels, also including the launch of our planning tools. And this week we'll also be having an orientation uh, to what we're doing with our public safety, which will be our third phase. So we'll be able to start making our, our GIS informational layers available so that our public safety partners can use that. So, um, like I mentioned, we, we do have a game plan, and I'm very pleased to report that, if anything, we're slightly ahead of our target schedule and under budget. But I think we're really poised this year to start seeing uh, both at an organizational and an operational level to success. But if Apple will ever just give us the okay, uh, we're ready to launch the MyVille app, and many of you have seen the beta. So um, I'm just going to quit talking about it until Apple says yes, and then we will do a full marketing outreach. But we do have, and I don't want to leave Android phones out, actually. For those of you with an Android phone, your phone could be ready to go and use it. But we do have a very exciting app that's going to allow you to share and report information, find out walking paths, systems like that, something you can use every day. Um, our own employees are ready to start using it as well as our partners. So it's an exciting tool, um, and I think it, uh, I do mince my words, but I do think this is a, a really exciting and valuable partnership that's worked well for both of us. Great. Thank you. I want to recognize our team also that, that traveled down with you that's been uh, doing a lot of the heavy lifting with 
data collection and working with their team down there to make it so robust. I remember when we uh, were at the conference where we were first introduced to this uh, whole project and they had a very impressive trailer set up and, and uh, working with them, is all, it, they're really uh, great people as well as really good at what they're doing. I think it's a really healthy partnership for us. So I do want to invite Samantha. Is it too wide angle for us to stay in our seats? So I would just like maybe lower your microphones down so that they're not right in the face. But I wanted a photo to be taken that we could send down to uh, our friends at Rancho Cucamonga. Great, thank you. Just to acknowledge that, um, yeah, I think your eyes were closed. It was the reflection. But. Um, <laughs> It shows a great collaboration when uh, they're willing to share something that's clearly effective in their community, and it's already paying dividends for us here. So um, thank you very much for that presentation. We're going to move on to our first of four public hearings. And actually, no, we're not. We're going to move on. We almost forgot. We moved things around. <laughs> Sorry, Lewis, to put that little uh, fear in you there. Um, we are going to move on to our administrative regular item that we moved up in the agenda. This is to consider adoption of uh, the Town of Yonville's Community Foundation. I'll stop there and uh, welcome a staff report. Thank you, Mayor Council. I'm going to move fairly quickly on this item because you've had several meetings on it. And at the last council meeting, you had some feedback and encouraged staff to look at uh, listening to some of the public comments on the board composition and structure which we've addressed um, we've also worked on trying to keep what is a unique opportunity recognizing that in Yountonville the town um, has started to take on greater roles and responsibilities and a lot of social and community structure um, when other entities either don't do it uh, case in point our after-school program the schools weren't doing that so it's something we picked up so one of the things we've really worked on is trying to write a catch-all language that allows potential <coughs> community initiatives uh, efforts done by other organizations not necessarily now but at some point in time they may choose to come under the umbrella that we originally identified for the um, town of Yountville Community Foundation this foundation is premised on core services that generally are the towns involved with including youth recreation education support community-based wellness enrichment programs senior recreation leisure education and support services parks and facility improvements cultural arts programs such as our public art walk gallery at the community hall literary programs and then we have one section that would be initiatives for other activities and events so we've worked on restructuring the bylaws to try to better reflect that and again that's a optional discretionary component of organizations I say initiatives ideas that could come forward more importantly you ask that staff kind of identify what the transition might be with the Yountville School Foundation uh, last time we discussed this we talked about two potential paths one of which is you approve that you want us to go that way we start the process for incorporating the nonprofit the other was to work with an existing nonprofit that maybe could amend its bylaws and morph in and that's exactly our morph into what this organization is um, and I will have to fully disclaim that I am a board member for the Yountville School Foundation I'm probably on over half the boards in the town of Yountville <laughs> along with some others but at this point we do have a representat representation from the Yountville School Foundation but based on some very positive outcomes with the Napa Valley Unified School District <coughs> the core initiative that the Yountville School Foundation was established for has been achieved the school district has indicated that Yountville Elementary School is not on the closure and that was one of the primary focus of the group that was involved with the Yountville School Foundation so at this point in time we do know that the preferred course of action and the town attorney has been working with guiding myself and the the potential folks at the Yountville School Foundation so we've identified a mechanism to go down that route should the council choose to provide direction 
So um, I'm going to stop now and take questions, but you have the proposed bylaws that identify the core areas of what the Town of Yountville Community Foundation would be involved, the nature of the bylaws, the relationship to include partners, and we identified a, that there would be officio staff members that are not part of the uh, myself and the Parks and Recreation Director would be ex officio. Um, town staff would be providing the financial, administrative, and the fiduciary activities with that. So with that, I'll take any questions you might have. And um, Well, before you continue, since we're technically the applicant, I want to make sure I formally open the public hearing. Since this is an administrative item, not a public hearing. Oh, that's right. We've, I forgot we moved it out of the public or <coughs> before but, the public thank hearing, you so never mind. But I believe the Vice Mayor did have a a disclosure you want to make? Uh, yes, and I <clears throat> think it's appropriate at this time, if not prior to this, to um, indicate that I am presently um, still the treasurer for the Yonville School Foundation uh, and will continue to serve on that board as it exists until such time as it does not. So, so there isn't a there isn't a conflict there. Uh, would there be a conflict if if that foundation were to be uh, a part of the community foundation going forward? Well, I want to clarify. For in terms of his ability to. <clears throat> what's going to potentially happen, there's really the action that the council is being asked to take tonight is twofold. One of which is to direct us to do so, and then second would be to authorize the town manager and town attorney to work with the principals of the Yountville School Foundation to transition that nonprofit into the town of Yountville Community Foundation. At that point, Yountville School Foundation, as it's currently known, will cease to operate, and the council will then begin. We'll, we'll need to recruit for um, board members to serve on the Town of Yountville Community Foundation board. Understood, but I, I just want to make sure that, and I'm sure the vice mayor wants to make sure that by participating in any approval at this stage, it doesn't. No, a conflict there's no forward. financial I, I don't believe there's any material interest for <laughs> myself or the, or the vice mayor with regards <laughs> to this okay thank you so with that um, any questions any other questions of the staff report I'll invite our member of the public that's here to speak on this issue tonight welcome back thank you Lewis Chilton my own property in Yonville. I'm not sure what to say to the, to the address answer. Um, uh, I thought it was a fortunate timing that I uh, was up in uh, Yonville this week uh, as we've been discussing this over a long period of time. But as Steve uh, did say, uh, the school foundation was formed uh, probably about six, seven years ago. We started the idea of putting together when uh, the future of the school next door was truly uh, in doubt. And um, I think I think that whole experience also brings uh, uh, to the fore why it would be good to have a more general community foundation um, that is supported by the town of Yonville. Uh, I'll, I'll use one example uh, where we now live and my, my son, his elementary school, is uh, he's in fifth grade. There are more students in his fifth grade uh, of all the classes than there are at the entire school uh, in Yonville. And when I... Um, um, tried not to get too involved there, but did ask, is there anything that, that people need help with? Uh, the PTA there said, we've got it all covered off for this year, which I, I didn't complain about. I, I can assure you that. But it, it, it kind of highlights to me in Yonville some of the challenges that exist just because uh, we are a small community and uh, it, it, we have a few people who do a whole lot of things. And for the a community foundation to exist which has the backing of the town from an administrative perspective and the current treasurer who tries to deal with the state of California can can tell um, that's a lot of work and uh, a lot of effort so to be able to take that off of uh, of a foundation and have that support while still being independent I think is very positive as well one of our concerns when we talked about kind of unwinding the school foundation was well, someday we may be in this situation again. And we, we formed a 501c3 because we had no vessel, if you want to talk about it, to deal with the school district or take donations. Um, and that's why we, why we founded it. And I think a, a general foundation still existing, if something were to occur next year or 10 years down the road, uh, we'll be able to address um, some of the issues that do exist. So our goal, when I speak about goal being the Yonville School Foundation, um, 
was rather than just taking the 501c3, uh, which does take time, effort, fees to put together, uh, if we could essentially repurpose it uh, in a new organization, uh, it would live on in a certain way. So I, I can say um, from everything I've heard, um, there's no doubt there's full support for this on the school foundation side. Um, I've talked with Steve and, and Michael um, just about the procedure, which is, is fairly simple. Uh, it'll take a little bit on the state side. Uh, our intention is any remaining funds or what we will do, um, provided that board uh, uh, approves it, I will not be presumptive, um, is we will donate the, uh, the remaining funds that the school foundation wrote, raised for the benefit of the school to the school uh, and then can repurpose um, that foundation to the new one if you all approve that. So I certainly do encourage you to improve that. Uh, I think it would be good for the, for the town and uh, we'll be able to survive for the long term. So thank you. Thank you very much. Any other members of the public like to comment on this item? And since the sheriff's still here, if you think you have a stop sign problem here, you should come to Southern California. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Seeing no other public comment, is there uh, any additional uh, discussion by the council? If not, is there action to be made? I can't see it on my screen. Yeah, I'll make a motion, I think. Uh, we'll, are we actually making a motion for this? To Recommending oh, the approval of the seeing. resolution. I'd like to make a motion to approve resolution number 153319, establishing the Town of Yonville Community Pro. Foundation. Yeah and directing town manager and town attorney to take action necessary to establish the TOICF. I'll second. Has anyone actually said that out loud to know that it doesn't, you know, sound like something that we don't want it to sound like? Okay. <laughs> Toicif? Right. Okay. I'm sure it's a Russian word. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, m motion by the vice mayor was that second by the council member Dornbecker. All in favor? Aye. 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 No opposed, so that passes unanimously. Thank you. And so the, uh, just to be clear in the actions, you, you will now be um, tasked with uh, outreach to organizations, including but not exclusively including the school foundation to see if there is interest in participation. We will do, remember, you will, under the bylaws, the council will be appointing the new <coughs> board of directors. So we will do your targeted outreach. Um, we have identified there's partner agencies so for this case initially there'll be a park and rec advisory commission member a arts commission member if there are some other community groups that want to do something and they do so early enough in the founding stages that could be addressed in the screening but more importantly although the interim clerk's not going to like what i'll say we will be starting the recruitment process to get the <clears throat> the five to nine members that are called for on the body Great. so we will start with that so and then i will be working simultaneously with the town attorney and the representative from the yountville school foundation to make that formal transition of the actual legal entity document <coughs> and then our staff uh, we will start work on our end which will include an organizational meeting because we'll need some organizational structure for the the committee the finance director will, will do internally uh, steps will be to, to move the art fund and the youth subsidy fund into the 5013c so those are the things that you will see happen based on the council's um, direction tonight okay thank you now we're going to move on to our public hearings the first one related to adoption thank you Lewis for uh, being in attendance and uh, thank you. sorry but we're going to recognize that you're leaving now <laughs> thank you for the next up uh, our first public hearing urgency ordinance to regulate marijuana cultivation and dispensaries in advance of the statutory deadline by the state town attorney sure um, mr. mayor members of the council um, for the sake of efficiency, I will sort of address this item and the, the following item together because they uh, obviously uh, have a lot to do with each other. Uh, but basically what we're looking at here is uh, a sort of standard procedure for when the uh, legislative body, in this case the town council, is faced with a deadline or an emergency or some other urgency issue and needs to both uh, enact legislation quickly but also wishes to consider more long-term legislation. 
And the first part of this is the urgency ordinance, and uh, the second is the the more permanent ordinance. So as you know, uh, a land use ordinance requires noticing before it can be adopted. It requires a first and second reading, and then it goes into effect 30 days after adoption on second reading. Uh, the most recent um, marijuana legislation passed, as I informed the council some meetings back, I can't remember exactly the date, uh, has a deadline of March 1st for the effective date of cultivation land use ordinances. Otherwise, the state laws will take effect by default. So that is the urgency under which we are operating, that we have to have something in place and effective prior to that March 1st deadline. Due to the normal noticing and first and second reading and effective date statutes, the standard ordinance procedure is going to be too late at this point. Uh, but the urgency ordinance will take effect immediately upon adoption. It does not require a first and second reading. Uh, what it requires is a four-fifths vote by the council and findings of urgency. So you'll see in, in these two ordinances, the urgency ordinance and the standard ordinance are very, very similar, if not identical, with the exception of the findings of urgency, which are contained in the urgency ordinance. And those essentially are the deadline I, I referenced earlier. Um, so the overall subject here is the regulation of marijuana dispensaries and cultivation within the town. And the first time we brought this to the council, I believe it was at the first meeting in December, uh, we included a prohibition on cultivation, uh, a prohibition on dispensaries, which is already in your code, and a prohibition on deliveries. And the reason for including the delivery prohibition is because under the new state statutory scheme, if you don't affirmatively prohibit deliveries, they may be allowed under the future permitting scheme that goes into effect in a couple years. They won't necessarily be allowed, but they might be absent and express prohibition. So we included that in the first draft, and the council's direction at that time was to remove the delivery prohibition, um, maybe pending further discussion, but for the time being to not prohibit deliveries. So the difference between what we presented first and this is that we took the delivery prohibition out. Otherwise, it's basically the same ordinance that we brought back at the beginning of December. Uh, so the urgency ordinance will, uh, if, if you adopt it, will take effect immediately. And then the more permanent ordinance, you can discuss, consider, uh, make changes to. You can have your first and second reading. And when it goes into effect, the first thing it does is it repeals the urgency ordinance. So the practical effect is if you were to adopt both without change, a seamless continuation of the <coughs> law. But the important thing to know is that the urgency ordinance is temporary. It exists to help us meet that statutory deadline so the town can preserve its land use authority. Uh, and then uh, pending the actual <coughs> adoption of a more permanent ordinance about uh, marijuana cultivation, dispensaries, and delivery if you wish to revisit that issue. So uh, as rambling as that might have been, that in a nutshell is, is what we're looking at here. The first item is the urgency ordinance, and then the second item, a separate item, is the more permanent uh, marijuana ordinance. With that, I'm, I'm happy to answer questions uh, about the procedure or the substance. And, I, and again, I, as I tried to do earlier on the non-public hearing, I do want to formally open the public hearing so that this discussion, being we being the applicant per se, uh, is part of the public hearing itself. If I may, the one, one thing I forgot to mention right at the outset is that uh, after posting the agenda, uh, it was brought to my attention that there was a typo in the version of the ordinance, both the urgency ordinance and the permanent one, that was posted online. And so I've given the council updated versions, and so the public is aware for full disclosure purposes, uh, references to deliveries that, were, that, that remained in the recitals um, have been removed. I don't know if we just went offline there, but uh, there was a flash. <laughs> no, we're going to keep going unless okay. Jeremy comes out and says we're off. So uh, that is the one difference between what was posted uh, online and in Granicus and what's in front of you. Um, it's a minor uh, change. It's what we might call a scrivener's error, uh, but basically a typo of a word. And uh, I'll ask the first question. This is in response specifically uh, to the, the deadline set uh, by state legislation um, regarding cultivation. The reason we can 
continue the discussion on deliveries is that that dead the deadline does not pertain to del deliveries in the sense of if we don't prohibit it now we lose all of our local uh, authority on that whereas if we don't act on the cultivation piece prior to the deadline you just described we mm -hmm. would lose local control over um, the cultivation piece that's correct so under the um, its official title is the medical marijuana regulation and safety act as it's currently written if the town does not regulate cultivation effective March 1st so that is adopted first second reading passed if you do the normal method if you don't have something in place by March 1st then then the town loses all ability thereafter to regulate cultivation the same deadline and prohibition or um, uh, preemption does not apply to delivery delivery will be allowed unless you prohibit it when those permits start being issued which uh, the state guesses is 2018 but basically that's dependent on a state scheme of permit issuance and any time after those start rolling out you could prohibit delivery and and stop the delivery of marijuana into the town if you felt that was something you wanted to do <coughs> that door is wide open to legislation and even though there's a cleanup bill that is moving forward that would remove yeah. the deadline it's not signed until it's signed and so the deadline is in effect until it's officially not in effect that's correct from my perspective uh, the law is what it is until it changes and uh, just as a side note my understanding following the the cleanup legislation is that it has been compromised by a number of riders uh, from various uh, sides of the marijuana issue which have complicated the bill significantly and what I mean by that is that some of your local control over cultivation um, is the subject of amendments that go along with repealing the deadline so some folks have added language that not only repeals the deadline but limits somewhat your ability to regulate cultivation and so those have complicated the committee process and and the uh, the author of the bill as I understand it completely pulled it from the the procedure based on those amendments because um, they seem to undermine local control and the whole point of that legislation was to give more local control so as usual we can't count on the legislature doing something clean and simple like removing that deadline we're gonna have to assume it's gonna be there um, until they remove it right thank you any other questions about the presentation on the first of these two related items any members of the public like to comment Welcome, Carrie. Hi, my name is Carrie Dorman. I'm a resident of Yountville. Um, I would like a clarification because my original comment was that the ordinance as proposed uses the term delivery or deliveries in a number of places. And I do understand from the town attorney that it has been taken out of the recitals, but if my memory is correct, I believe it also is used in um, the actual substance of the ordinance where it says numbers one and two are the prohibited items I think deliveries is used there also thank you Town attorney so um, what I believe uh, she's referring to is section 2 marijuana cultivation and dispensaries prohibited um, number one says marijuana cultivation is prohibited number two says marijuana dispensaries or any other facility or use which involves the manufacture cultivation or distribution of drugs or other substances which it is illegal to distribute or possess under state or federal law uh, this prohibition refers to facilities or uses so um, a dispensary or a use of the property would be prohibited from essentially distributing selling handing out marijuana of any kind uh, this would still allow for a delivery from a facility or use outside of the town limits so this is specifically limited to physical presences within the town it's a land use issue within the town a dispensary could not distribute within the town because they're prohibited a dispensary operating within the town correct but a dispensary operating outside the town could theoretically still deliver without violating this uh, <coughs> this ordinance I, I should point out though that until those permits go into effect I do not think it is actually legal for a dispensary to deliver marijuana I think that that is something that's legal with a permit once those permits be are issued 
but currently the law has its own way of dealing with people who drive with marijuana and I think you either have to be a patient or a qualified caregiver but I leave that to dispensaries to consult their own legal counsel about what's lawful and what isn't but I believe that this would allow a dispensary with a lawful permit when and if they're issued to deliver without violating this particular language I think it was to the vice mayor's point that uh, caused our discussion and, and the change to the original language, which was we did not, I think the, um, at least the majority, if not the entire council, uh, agreed with the point that we were not looking to overly burden someone who had legitimate recommendation of medical use of marijuana. And so, and because you identified the fact that the delivery component was not under the same uh, deadline as the cultivation piece, that we can evaluate that going forward. That's right, yeah. Yeah, Councilmember Dornbecker? Well, if um, actual dispensaries are prohibited in the town of Yachtville, which we have already done, mm -hmm. and then it seems a moot point that, you know, uh, a number two, that marijuana dispensaries or any other facility, as you're saying, within the town limits. We've already we've already said no we're not going to have any well this is certainly an additional prohibition to what you already have uh, so you already do have a prohibition in place this is adding to it and clarifying uh, a little bit more what exactly we mean by that this language also is intended to cover uh, what I might call a mobile dispensary, which is uh -huh. distinct from a, a delivery in that, it, to me, it would be a facility or use, just like a, a, a mobile food vendor is. Um, it would prevent that type of, a, of an activity as well, which I think is an important clarification to make before it actually comes. I see. Uh, so you. this is a little bit of cleanup as well. I see. One other question. I, I, I seem to recall that it came up in our earlier discussion. Um, how this may relate or not to residents of the town of Yonville who live at the Veterans Home, which is a state facility. Are you prepared to speak to whether this impacts the status of those residents? Yes. I, we. I have to say I don't think that our land use regulations in general reach the Veterans Home. So it is my understanding that that this will not impact their activities or, or lifestyle at the at the veterans home itself. They're already under their own jurisdiction and restrictions as it relates to this and any other activities. That's my understanding. Okay. So any other questions? I think we've had our public comment. I'll close the public hearing and invite action uh, by the council. Is there a motion to be had on the first item, the urgency ordinance? I'll make a motion <clears throat> to approve, I'm sure I'm going to get the number wrong, ordinance number 15XXXU, an urgency ordinance of the town of Yonville permitting the cultivation of marijuana and marijuana dispensaries. I think we should have a number, shouldn't we? Or Tri do we triple not? Triple X seems a little. Yeah, th those are intended salty. to be placeholders. But we could give it. Number zero zero one U. I don't know if you have. Well, six oh one is on the agenda, but that's not ordering necessary. nomenclature. The in five ninety six. So it would be um, sixteen dash four four six. As noted. Sixteen dash four four six. Because we have a four 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 and a four four five coming up. All right. So sixteen dash four four six is the motion. Is yes. That that's correct. As clear as we need it for the record? Okay. I'll second. Councilmember Dornbecker, second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 So the urgency ordinance passes by more than a four fifths with actually a unanimous vote. So the related item is our next public hearing. Okay. Introduction and a waiving of the reading of uh, to amend the municipal code to regulate marijuana dispensaries and cultivation. Is there further? staff report or all the only note I might make on this is that um, now that you have the urgency ordinance in place this ordinance you can deliberate on and discuss and postpone and bring back as 
a little bit with a little bit more freedom now that you have the urgency ordinance in place. So if, if you want to make changes to this, if you want to tinker with it, if you want to consider it a little further, you're not under the same deadline you were when we first brought this up in December. Uh, so that's the only note I might make is that you've met your deadline. Now you can treat this like any other ordinance and, and take your time or make an action if you're ready to make an action. Well, I think we could certainly, t first of all, I'm going to open the public hearing on this item. Okay, before I open the public hearing, Vice Mayor, a question. Thank you. So what precludes any agency from issuing an urgency ordinance if they want to get around the 30-day notice period? You have to make findings of, of the need. There has to be a finding of a yeah, need. which are included in the urgency ordinance Correct. you just passed. Okay. And the, in this case, the urgency was to, uh, to regulate the activity, which is potentially injurious to the public, prior to the deadline at which point you would lose the ability to regulate. So that, that's your urgency. Um, of course, over time, that urgency uh, may be more and more difficult to justify. So you do want to, at some point, make a permanent ordinance, and that's what this is about. But you do have a little more time. Uh, but y yes, you need to make those findings, and you need a four-fifths vote. Okay. So it's those two conditions. There have to be specific findings. They can't necessarily be capricious or... That's right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. So getting back to, to this item, I just want to state now so it's not forgotten in the um, ordinance that we are considering now, the very first item does not have the uh, ordinance number. So let's make sure that's now 16-446-U. This ordinance would be repealing that previous action that we just took. Just one I will point out. The original ones had their number, and when the, the attorney reprinted them off that, if you look on your agenda, the agenda actually references the number, so we'll we'll cut that all. It doesn't up. for the urgency ordinance, though, Steve. Mm -hmm. The others are have numbers, but the, hmm. the others do, yes, but not the urgency. No, it shows here is, but I'll we'll work through. The numbers on the left are not the uh, not ordinance right. numbers. Ah, the blue okay, numbers. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. All right. <coughs> so I'll, I want to make sure the public hearing is officially open. If it, it hasn't already been, uh, I'll invite any. Uh, public comment since the applicant is us and we've already brought that forward seeing no members of the public coming forward I'll close the public hearing and invite discussion <laughs> and potential action by the council comments from the council councilmember Dornbecker uh, no I was just um, for a point of clarification then would the ordinance number be 16-446 or 16-444 16-446-U that was the that was the one we already did. Oh, you're, you're right. I'm so sorry. Sixteen yes. four 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 would is okay. the action that we're that is, discussing. That is the right one because that's the one that's where we brought that. I see. So I would just yes. I'm ready to make a motion. Feel free. I move that we approve uh, ordinance number sixteen four four four, an ordinance of the town of Yountville amending chapter seventeen point eighteen, prohibited uses of the Yountville municipal code. I believe we're actually inter introducing and waiving the reading as opposed to oh, I'm sorry, passing that. introducing and waiving the reading. So is that motion clear? Yeah. Is there a second to that motion? Second. Vice Mayor seconded. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? That is unanimous and it is passed. So just so that we're all clear, that assuming that we go to a second reading and it's approved, that will take effect after the deadline, which is why we have the urgency ordinance to take care of us between now and then. Right. That's right. Very good. Thank you, Town Attorney, for um, clarifying a fairly complex set of circumstances. Next up, introduction and uh, consideration of an ordinance amending our sign municipal code. So um, this has been discussed here before um, but the this is the reason for this ordinance is, is probably twofold uh, one is part of my ongoing process of looking through the town's codes and finding things to update or clean up or or make uh, suggested changes um, my looking at this section was prompted by a recent Supreme Court United States Supreme Court decision about sign ordinances um, and it made very very clear some 
uh, First Amendment rules and uh, restrictions on our ability to regulate signs and other expressive conduct. Um, and in response to that case, we took a close look at the town's ordinance and made the changes that are suggested in this ordinance. Uh, the council asked us to take those first to the ZDRB, the Zoning Design Review Board, and we did. We took it to the board uh, on two different meetings, got some great feedback, had a lot of good discussions, and I think the most important thing to communicate back to the council is that these changes, what's in front of you now, are a temporary fix intended to bring the code in compliance with the, the more recent decisions of the Supreme Court on this area of constitutional law, and that staff and the ZDRB is committed to pursuing on a more long-term basis a more fundamental overhaul of the code to rethink what exactly the, the town's needs and purposes are in a signed code, um, to get rid of some stuff that maybe has been hanging around for a long time that nobody uses or needs anymore in terms of enforcement tools, and to uh, generally approach the subject uh, from a fresh perspective. That's going to take a little bit of time. So this is in front of you now to make sure that we're compliant in the meantime, and then staff and the board will go back and, um, and bring a more comprehensive update at a later time. So I, I, I recognized today when reviewing the agenda packet that you have a clean version of the proposed ordinance. And what we provided to you here at the meeting, and it's available to the public as well if they want to review it, is a, a red line, which might give you a more detailed view of what exact changes were made, what, what language was struck, what uh, language was changed. Uh, but you'll see primarily the, the theme here is to avoid content-based restrictions and definitions. So in a nutshell, that means uh, a, a definition or a prohibition that depends upon the content of the sign has now been removed, and it instead has been uh, linked to a use on the property in, in question. That's the short version of, of what we did here. Uh, and I'd be happy to go into detail about, about how that works if you like, but um, I'll, I'll leave it to you to, to request that level of, <laughs> of lecturing. Well, that, le that level is rather extensive now that we have the red line copy here to see yes. the significant uh, language changes that have been made. That's true. However, I should note that um, for the most part, what we did is attempt to preserve as much as possible of your existing code. So almost all of the types of signs and, uh, and prohibitions and restrictions and sizes and uh, shape restrictions and that sort of thing, that's been preserved as much as possible. What's been changed is the definitions that depend upon the content of the sign. So to the greatest extent possible, we tried to preserve your code. That's the short version of that. Right. Again, I'll uh, formally open the public hearing, invite members of the public to comment on this item. Gary's coming back up. We're going to make you sit up in the front row if you're going to keep coming up like no, this. this is my only workout. <laughs> so um, I'm here both as a resident of the town and as a member of the town's uh, ZDRB. And I am, I have never played a lawyer on TV. I am still a lawyer in Texas. I am not a lawyer in California, so I'm not here giving any legal advice. But I... Um, my takeaway from the Zoning and Design Review Board meetings is um, we have been especially interested in the proposed changes to Section 17.92.110, which is design criteria, and in particular the proposed Section A. Um, we have had a number of discussions with this with the town attorney and uh, both in open and closed session. I won't go into anything that was said in closed session, but... Uh, actually, okay, just before you keep going, I, I hear ruffling of page page 19 of 24 yeah. is the section. Oh, sorry. I only took a snapshot That's on okay. my iPad. Go ahead. Um, so, uh, and I have talked briefly to the town attorney about this. In my travels of trying to figure out what we might and could do, along with my other um, board members, I found a Ninth Circuit case um, out of um, the city of Lake Oswego, which I guess is in Oregon, but it's still the Ninth Circuit, which governs us. And it um, talks about whether or not 
uh, color and things like that can be regulated without constitutional violation. And some of the things the case says, the bottom line is, um, says the city is not obligated. The statute reads, let me just read you the statute first. Signs shall be designed to be compatible with other nearby signs, other elements of street and site furniture, and with adjacent structures. Compatibility shall be determined by the relationships of the elements of form, proportion, scale, color, materials, surface treatment, overall sign size, and the size and style of lettering. That's from the Lake Oswego Sign Code. And as nearly as I can tell, that is what was in effect when this case was decided in 2006. And the court held that that kind of language was acceptable. I think I am speaking appropriately for my colleagues on the ZDRB when I say that there, something like that, if it can be done, is more what we would prefer, even as the temporary fix. Um, because I personally have a concern that if our temporary fix goes this way and our final fix goes that way, we have something that's happened during the temporary time period that may not be permanently acceptable. So I'm just trying to hope all the pieces can fit together, um, as Mike said before, in a seamless way. So I would just ask for maybe something around more compatible, that kind of language. Thank you. Any other public comment? So I'll invite our town attorney to uh, make a comment about that statement. So we did discuss this subject quite a bit, actually. And um, that Ninth Circuit case is an interesting and important case. Uh, there is quite a bit of Supreme Court language that suggests that it, you must have a, a much more specific criteria in order to approve or deny a signed permit. So to the extent that we can try to craft some language that we think satisfies the Supreme Court's writings on this subject and, uh, and, and the town's need to have some flexibility and discretion, it, it's going to be, I think, a longer term project to find that language that's going to work. And it's not something that can be arrived at relatively quickly. I do agree we probably can find something that gives the, the town and more specifically the ZDRB some, um, some level of guided discretion. Uh, but I, I would hesitate to follow the Lake Oswego model uh, exactly as it's written. I, I recognize that that case is out there. Um, but without going into too much detail, there are cases from the Supreme Court, which of course takes precedence over the Ninth Circuit, that I, I think are, are maybe inconsistent with that, that holding from the Lake Oswego case. So I, I think at this point, it's a little bit difficult to engage in that process on a short-term basis. And that is absolutely going to be part of our long-term discussion with the ZDRB and the town council and planning staff. Uh, I, it just didn't quite fit into the, the more urgent need to get something done to the town's code in the meantime. I don't know if that answers the question really, but it, it's, it's a much more difficult question than it seems at first. So more specific direction could be more challengeable. Is that generally what you're saying? Let me back it up. The, the, the issue here is not actually going to be uh, content-based restrictions. That's what the, the more recent case was about. What we're looking at with respect to um, the 110 section design criteria and the discretion of uh, the design review board is that under the First Amendment, you can't have open-ended discretion to decision makers to approve or deny communication. And the uh, sort of absurd example of this is that you have uh, the Girl Scouts coming and saying, we have a sign of, of this size saying we want to sell cookies. And you say, that's great. Go forth and sell cookies. You're approved. And then the Ku Klux Klan comes and, sa and has a, a hateful message. And you say, oh, no, we don't really like the color or the design of your sign. It doesn't fit aesthetically with our town. And so what really is happening there is that the decision maker is using, and I'm not saying this would happen here, but this is what the Supreme Court says is the problem. If you have unbounded discretion given to a permit issuance body, they can disguise the uh, effort to censor speech in aesthetics. So the answer to this, according to the Supreme Court, is you must have objective, definite, concrete standards to which you can point and say, 
these are the approved designs, these are the approved colors, these are the approved sizes, this is the approved materials. You can say whatever you want as long as it meets these standards. Somewhere between those is the effort to have some kind of a guided discretion. And that's what Lake Oswego is, is about, is saying we're not going to say specifically what your design has to look like, but it has to be compatible with surrounding design, surrounding signs, surrounding property uses. Um, it's still a little subjective to my eye to say uh, that this is compatible and this is not compatible, but the Ninth Circuit felt like it was definite enough. The Supreme Court has said in some instances it needs to be concrete and objective. So this is why it's a more complicated question than just sort of adopting something that's been approved before. The United States Supreme Court has, has had a slightly different take on it, and that's the one that we're really focused on, trying to figure out what it is that they would approve or not approve. So it, it, th that's sort of a, a, a five-minute um, uh, exploration of some very, very subtle and complicated First Amendment issues. <laughs> but we will revisit them for sure. But I'm trying to explain why it's something we couldn't do quickly in a couple of ZDRB meetings. Fair enough. It is on our radar, though, and we're, and we're working on it very hard. Thank you for that explanation. Uh, Councilman Dornbecker, did you have a comment? I do, and that is that my perception of the Lake Oswego ordinance that was read to us is very similar to what we have in that the colors uh, must be selected from an approved color palette, which is sort of, um, I don't know, to me, it's, it's, they're very, very similar. The, the, adopting the, uh, a specific palette or... Um, or referencing specific colors used in a building to which the sign is attached, something to that effect, is much more definite than Lake Oswego's approach. Their approach looks for a finding of, quote, compatibility, mm. unquote. I see. And that's where I am a little bit suspicious of the subjective nature of the finding. It's, it's less subjective than, um, than what the, the town's current code allows, the Oswego version is, but it's, it's I think, more subjective than, than what I would recommend. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah. All right, Jerome. The only design criteria we're talking about is color here. Mm -hmm. There's no other design criteria. In the current code? In the one I have in front of me. In the proposed one, that's right. Um, and that's by design. Uh, and I don't mean to mix up terms, that was by intention mm -hmm. to, um, to try to find something concrete and definite that we can point to in terms of criteria, in terms of uh, making a finding by the permit issuance body, the ZDRB. Uh, we struggled with a few other options like uh, shapes or um, uh, some other objective criteria we could point to, and, and this was the, the most I felt sort of comfortable recommending. Um, again, this is why it would be a, a longer term process to try to come up with a solution that gives more discretion or more uh, options in terms of what criteria to apply. So all were throughout the ordinance, in, in another part of the ordinance, we state what the size of the sign oh, can be yes. based on the size of the walls and the size of the building. Y yes, I should. So the overall mm -hmm. um, dimensions and construction and location and all of the other specifics of the sign would be um, spelled out in other sections of the ordinance. This was the, uh, if you will, the aesthetic or the, or the design area involves color. Um, the shape and size of it uh, yeah, are governed by the, the type of, of use on the property and, and the other provisions of the code. Right, and so just to clarify, the other part of the ordinance states the location and the size. It doesn't. It doesn't state this the shape, the elements that can be used in it. And then this design section only states color. Right. And and you could, I suppose, add um, to that materials to the extent that they're not already included elsewhere. Um, but that's right. This this only references color for the time being. Okay. That's it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Other questions, Councilmember Muller? Anything? Okay. I can't remember if we've, we're still in public hearing. I think, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm going to close that and uh, invite action by the council. Is there action to be had on this item? And I, I did 
we, it's been brought to my attention the electronic version of the ordinance does not have the number in the title, but it is 16 445. Councilmember Muller. Would you like a motion? If you are ready to present one, yes. I'll make a motion that we approve uh, ordinance number 16 445. Introduce and later reading. Thank you. An ordinance of the Town of Yonville amending Chapter 17.92 signs of the uh, Yonville Municipal Code, Yonville Municipal Code, and uh, well, we, we, I'm going to introduce and waive the reading. I'll second. Thank you. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No opposed. Thank you. That passes. And uh, Carrie, we. Uh, Thank you for bringing forward that concern that's been discussed, and I appreciate that we were able to have some clarifying discussion about that, that there is much more to be done going forward. So I appreciate Absolutely. that. Okay, now we're moving on to our fourth and final public hearing as it relates to Master Development Plan Amendment with Hotel Yonfell. Good evening. Andrew, go ahead. Tonight you have before you a master development plan amendment including design review amendment and use permit amendment for Hotel Yauntville to open selected facilities to the public. And these facilities would include the Y Bar Lounge, the Hopper Creek Kitchen Restaurant, and Spa Aqua. And these facilities are currently open and available only to hotel guests under the approved permits. Um, and the application before you tonight is only to open these facilities. The other hotel facilities would remain um, available to guests only, and that includes the the, the pool and the related um, the deck and the pool bar, as well as the exercise room and all other grounds. Um, so, starting with the Y bar, it is located at the hotel entrance at the lobby adjacent to the registration area, and it consists of a typical bar with six seats, as well as the lounge area that contains 26 seats, and the outdoor terrace that contains about 34 seats. And it's available to guests for beer or wine and drinks, as well as small bites, um, similar to a cocktail menu. And it's currently open from April through mid-November from 5 p.m. daily until midnight. And then from mid-November through March, it's generally open from noon to midnight. And that's because during that part of the year, the, the pool bar is closed. Um, under this application, the applicant would seek to extend the hours of operation until 1 AM. And the goal is to create a real comfortable lounge environment um, where you could go and have drinks and grab a bite to eat. There would be low background music, a just real comfortable place to to grab a drink. Um, the applicant indicates that the change in um, model to be open to the public would require an additional bartender during the busiest times and up to two new servers on overlapping shifts. Um, the menu of small bites is not really expected to change significantly, although it may have some, some fine tuning um, to it. Um, Additionally, the applicant is seeking to make some minor design modifications to the outdoor terrace, and this is to allow use of the, the outdoor area in inclement weather and to make it more comfy and cozy. Um, one is to install a, um, a cover on the, on, the, um, on the trellis, and this would lay flat upon that trellis. It wouldn't introduce new um, massing. It, there, it doesn't contribute to site FAR. And the other change is to add a new outdoor bar at the west side of the terrace, closest to Washington Street. And this too would be minor. It's um, on the scale of a bar about 8 to 10 feet in length with six bar stools. So we're considering this um, minor and incidental and um, consistent with the design ordinance. Um, moving on, the Hopper Creek Restaurant Kitchen is another facility they would like to open to the public. When originally approved, it was really presented as a dining facility 
for guests, and it's open for breakfast and lunch from 7 a.m. until 11.30 a.m., and an all-day dining menu is available until 5. It um, is closed for the dinner hour, but the kitchen itself is open because the hotel serves um, <coughs> room service all day long and into the evening until 9.30. So the change would allow the Hopper Creek Kitchen to be open for dinner between 5 p.m. and 10 p.m. Um, and this would result in a change in staff of up to four or five um, new wait staff, one hostess, two waiters, and one back waiter. No changes to the kitchen staff are necessary since it's already open um, for, for room service and the applicant indicates that that staff can, would, would be able to serve the, di the dinner service as well. Um, and that's what you're looking at with the restaurant. The spa is located opposite the restaurant on the other side of the pool, and it has six treatment rooms, a manicure pedicure room, uh, men's and women's locker rooms, and a small boutique. And this uh, layout isn't going to change. Um, it is open from 7 a.m. until 8 p.m., and there are no changes proposed there. Um, and the applicant is additionally doesn't expect um, new employees, although they would work with on-call therapists for reservations to come in 30 minutes before a treatment and leave 30 minutes after a treatment. Um, so the, the main impact of opening the hotel's facilities to the public would obviously be on parking. There would be new employees that need to be um, served as well as um, new new guests and that number could be significant based on the area of the spaces and the number of seats available. Um, so we have calculated the parking demand on the municipal code standards for parking and we estimate that the um, that by expanding the use to be open to the public would require an additional 55 spaces and that's for the parking demand of each of the individual uses and I'll just quickly go through those for the bar it's calculated at one parking space for the building occupancy of three and occupancy is based on one person for every 15 square feet the restaurant parking standard is one parking space for every three restaurant seats and the Spa parking standard is based on a retail or personal services standard of one space for every 250 square feet. Um, and that gives us a number that we have then reduced by 25% because it's a shared use facility and the overlapping nature of those uses means that there um, is less of an overall parking demand. So when we look at existing spaces in the parking lot, the applicant indicates there are 89 and yet when you look at the minimum parking space is necessary for the hotel itself it is a minimum of 91 and when the spa was approved there was an additional number um, and there has been the parking lot was a design to accommodate these spaces and they've either been the stalls have not been painted or they've been removed for use of um, hotel housekeeping's um, golf carts or in the case of the largest suite it's the four spaces adjacent to that is um, marked with a um, reserve sign and staff um, observe these modifications as part of this permit and part of the normal use monitoring of, of the use so this application presents an opportunity to correct that to regain the deficiency of two that we're facing and then also address all the additional spaces for the use and I do want to comment that we have taken a very conservative approach to requiring parking and it's the minimum necessary for all the shared uses um, the applicant has submitted a parking study where the traffic consultant indicates that um, in her opinion there's an alternate mode of um, evaluating that but our code does not have um, a ratio or a standard to determine how we could um, calculate the additional needs so we're falling back on what we call worst case scenario if this was a popular destination for a bar a restaurant and a spa what would be required um, so in staff's opinion the minimum number of parking spaces required would be um, 57 and we have um, 
been working with the applicant to provide spaces in addition to the lot and there's an opportunity on Champagne Drive to gain an additional eight spaces and we believe that the hotel should be um, able to take a reduction for those since that is a private street and they haven't um, been conditioned to have those spaces and yet they'll serve their their parking needs so that leaves a deficiency of 47 spaces that we um, need to address if um, there's really any merit or justification in opening this use to the public and not having that parking burden um, wind up on the streets and so the applicant has been in the early discussions with um, the town manager and um, an ad hoc committee of the council as to the opportunity to build a lot to satisfy this demand and early engineering um, models of that lot are that it could take um, 41 to 47 spaces and if those were indeed constructed and allocated for this use um, that would go toward meeting the parking demand and in order to um, manage this um, newer model of providing parking staff has suggested um, a parking management plan similar to other businesses in town with the elements that are outlined in the staff report and also um, in the conditions of approval and those are that the employer shall submit a list of license plates um, for all employees um, and that this shall be updated annually or upon change of employee um, employment or vehicle that the 10 management employees that are already currently required to park on site by resolution shall continue to do so that they shall not park on the city streets that each employee monitored um, registered in the program will have a parking sticker to identify their vehicle and that they'll be required to park in approved parking zones that would be the parking lot on Washington Street south of Champaign Drive on Champaign Drive or in other um, approved locations but that there is a new prohibited parking zone and that would be Washington Street from California to Champaign in order to make that busy area available to um, users of the park but also the additional guests that um, we're hoping would use these new facilities so um, as indicated in the staff report parking is our main issue but we believe that um, should agreement be made on um, constructing a parking lot to accommodate this need that it would go um, toward mitigating that um, that issue so I'm happy to answer any questions and I know the applicant is here to to give a presentation and answer questions right okay. questions of the staff report well, That's where door and that is um, so if the applicant and the town do reach an agreement and they build that parking lot that parking lot essentially doesn't serve the rest of the town it only serves the hotel is that correct no the terms of the um, agreement would be that 20 or so spaces would be open to the public that the others would be marked for use by hotel guests so it would still be a shared lot um, and not for the exclusive use of the hotel so we I, I thought I understood you to say that the lot could accommodate 47 spaces is that correct up to that yes we up believe. to that uh, but that's like that's sort of what they need isn't it so I I caution the discussion to not include an item that we're not actually addressing tonight oh because uh, it's up to the applicant to come up with a parking management plan they may come up with a plan that doesn't even include building a parking lot I see um, that's unlikely but it is possible it's feasible so um, I ask that we keep the discussion related to this if there is uh, an approval of this item pre as presented tonight it doesn't take effect unless they come up with the parking solution I see so is, okay. is that a fair way to put it Steve and that's Mike? correct okay thank you so thank you okay any other questions no. at this point uh, councilmember Durham councilmember Moeller question vice mayor I'm good for now so I do have um, a couple questions if you could run back over the existing hotel parking deficiencies you mentioned something about reserve spaces for a suite and housekeeping was using spaces that could actually be used for guest parking is that right what we observed is that in the older lot there were two spaces that were removed from guest parking and those two are used for the, the golf carts and that in the newer portion of the lot there were four um, parallel spaces adjacent to the suite that had had the parking tees removed um, and there was a reserved parking sticker so 
I guess the assumption is that uh, the suite would park one vehicle there, but then the other three are probably not being used for that use. And so there are, is a deficiency. And are you recommending in your report that those return to individual vehicle parking spaces, all of them for, for guest use? Which not necessarily not if necessarily. we have an ability to um, obtain the number of spaces that are needed under um, the parking standards that have been recalped for the property. And that includes a potential off-site solution to roughly 40-something spaces, eight additional on Champaign Drive? Yes. And is in your calculations, is there any inclusion in, I'm assuming there's no inclusion of the uh, public street parking that's new and added to the south part of California <laughs> along no. so yeah. if We're it's not public parking you don't calculate that at all <clears throat> into what they're required to provide correct and one of the other um, uses we've talked about with other businesses is tandem parking uh, have you analyzed the ability to do that anywhere in the existing uh, parking areas on site that might be a mitigation yeah. to what they need well, a cursory view of how the parking lot is laid out it doesn't look like that's possible what we do have at Hotel Yountville are the 10 employee spaces that are on um, the 10 management employees that are parking on site um, and we feel that goes a long way to meeting the standard when we're talking about 90 spaces um, mm -hmm. in total I, I, um, in the same vein mr. mayor that you're talking for the council and it sort of reflects council member Dornbecker um, comment earlier I want everybody to remember when planning director Liston talks about the number of parking that includes all sources that includes the guest and the employees so when we talk about that you know a practical expectation maybe we're shifting employees further south but with that opening closer proximity so that that number reflects what we anticipate those of us residents and others that may be coming to go to the lounge or to the spa it's also providing adequate parking for them so I just want right. to make sure that we're not fixating solely on employee parking because that total number is a distributed number under our parking code our parking code is an aggregate of anybody associated with the use right. uh, going to the drawing set Sandra um, my question is going to pertain to um, the request for outdoor patio bar activity but a restriction on that public activity um, accessing the pool area. I believe you said that. Mm -hmm. But those two uses are almost immediately adjacent. Mm -hmm. Is there? No. Um, I'm looking at page four or five, the outdoor Hopper Creek outdoor dining area. Oh, right, the dining area. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I thought you meant the the bar. But it's. Isn't that where the outdoor bar is being proposed? The mm -hmm. no. no, the bar is just off the lobby. It's right here. It's separated from the restaurant um, by a parking lot and several in units. It's the upper left up here as well. Yeah, yeah. I could stand up here and the show upper you. left. Mm -hmm. So this okay. is the the entry and the lobby, the reception, the, the indoor um, bar and the outdoor okay. bar. Got it. I got you. Okay. I was just looking at okay I was confusing patios um, okay so my my general question was going to be are you concerned that there is uh, adequate separation of activity but if this is going to be off the a different portion of the building then that's a non-issue now so they're not looking to add anything outside the outdoor dining space at the kit the the restaurant other than the described uses of the restaurant and the hours going right, into the evening. Correct. Okay, then that satisfies my question. Thank you. Uh, I know we do have the applicant here. I'll um, invite the applicant up to uh, present. And if I didn't say it, I'm going to formally open the public hearing and, and invite you to speak. Thank you. Good evening. You're welcome. I, I'd first of all like to thank everyone uh, for their support last time around our on our exercise room it's uh, we've pulled the permits right down we've got permits and we're ready to go 
So uh, we hope to have that open by the spring time. So really appreciate that, the support there. Um, I'd add a couple things, I guess, to what, what Sandra said um, in, in her report. There, there are a variety of reasons we're looking to do this. One is obviously to maximize the use of the property, and the, and uh, from a financial perspective, we think this is a good thing to do. And maybe more importantly is is that uh, we feel what we're trying to do is fill maybe a, a bit of a void that doesn't exist here in Yonville from an experience perspective. Um, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And in the third reason really is that we uh, feel that doing this is going to make the hotel, our hotel, Yonville, more competitive, but also make Yonville as a town more competitive. Um, and I'll discuss that in a, in a minute. But the the Y bar um, is an area, and in, in a lot of you maybe have not been to the hotel because we're obviously not open to the public, but it's an incredibly beautiful setting and we want to create more of a sophisticated lounge type environment where people can come prior to dinner, have a drink, go to dinner, and the others to come back after dinner and a place to sit and have, have drinks and cocktails. There's really nothing that like it that exists in, in Yonville. So we'd like to try to create something like that. It'd be very uh, low key, but uh, seating areas where people can talk privately in groups and, and, and gather. We really don't have anything like that in Yonville. Uh, our guests, current guests, are the only ones that use it, and they have great experience. And um, we think the locals would have a great experience there as well as, as other guests staying in, in other hotels, as well as our own hotel guests. So we feel that that would be a really great atmosphere to sit inside or out and would hand, enhance what Yonville has to offer. Uh, the Hopper Creek Kitchen is a place where we focus primarily on breakfast, breakfast service. It's kind of, an, again, unique, one of a kind um, in Yonville. Uh, we get a lot of requests for people to have breakfast there. We, uh, we decline them. We tell them we're, we're not open to the public. But, and that's, that's local people living in Yonville as well as other guests staying in other hotels. So we feel that restaurant um, could be something, again, unique to what Yonville has to offer. And again, we're not open in the evening, but opening it would add yet another unique element to what Yonville has to offer. Uh, the, the spa is a small spa. It's very, uh, very intimate kind of a of an experience. Uh, we specialize in couples treatments and, and uh, uh, our guests are, we get some of the highest uh, guest satisfaction scores out of our, our spa. It's a really unique experience. So we also feel that people staying in other hotels or local uh, residents would like to enjoy it as well. But as Sandra said, it does not include the use of the pool deck area or the pool bar. It's just exclusive to the um, uh, exclusive to the uh, to the spa itself. The uh, just to address a little bit of the parking situation, we we know this w parking is a bit of an issue, um, and uh, we feel some kind of cooperation with uh, building uh, that lot at the south part of town will not only enhance the south part of the town, but will also really kind of fix a a, a, a lot of parking problems. In, in that area. So that's why we're seeking the approval uh, of this. I'm open to any questions you might have. Thank you. Questions of the applicant? No. And just to just to clarify, as I stated when Councilmember Dornbecker brought it up, that uh, parking lot is a separate issue, the, yes. the off-site parking lot. It, it's a likely or possible solution to your deficiency, but it's not something that we're addressing Directly, at least tonight. So, just to make that clarification. Yes. Understood. All right. Thank you very thank much. You. Any other members of the public audience like to comment? No, you got enough exercise for, for tonight, <coughs> Carrie. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Ten thousand <laughs> steps. Um, seeing no other uh, public com uh, uh, comment, I'll close the public hearing and invite deliberation and potential action by the council. 
who would like to uh, go first? Vice Mayor? Sure, why ready? not? I, you know, uh, this this is a unique property, and it's, I mean, obviously it's the largest commercial property we have on the south end of town, and I've always wondered to myself, and, and not having necessarily all the foresight of the original master development plan and why it was structured the way it was, um, although I we've had our challenges in the past, but that, you know, that's the past. Uh, this is a, it's an incredible asset, and I've always wondered why there hasn't been public access. I've been fortunate enough to be in that Y Lounge because I had a friend stay, in the, stay at the hotel, and I've been out there for cocktails, and probably shouldn't admit that out loud, but um, it is a nice space. You know, I, <clears throat> aside from the parking deficiency, which we'll have to come up with a plan that will be able to support it, you know, the south end of town doesn't have commercial environment, commercial activity. This would be sort of an interesting way to bring that together, especially since we do use the park quite a bit, and uh, there may be an opportunity for people to pop across the street and have a beverage or even grab a bite to eat if they're down the south end of town, um, rather than necessarily walking or taking the uh, the trolley back up. But I, I mean, I, I don't have particular issue with, with any of the requests per se. I think it's, you know, these businesses have to evolve and we're getting into a much more competitive marketplace in Napa County and so for the property to be able to continue to be competitive um, having having that access um, I think is, uh, is something that I would be open to and I think is consistent with what the use of the property ultimately would be um, it's how we how we attenuate the issues around that many deficient spaces and not talking about the potential parking space on the south south end of town we'd still be deficient six spaces so there's a dialogue that would have to occur around that i believe if my math was correct but since we're not including that in this dialogue that would be my my only comments at this time thank you anyone like to speak next council member moeller are you ready um yeah i think that um I'm not going to even speak on that extra lot right now, but um, I, I remember when the, the spa kind of came up, there was a lot of discussion at the council, December 2nd, 2008. I remember it quite well. It was my very first meeting. And there was people in the audience and, the, and uh, a lot of people in the council really thought it should be open. And, and perhaps things, uh, you know, have changed since then. I'm, I'm not really certain because, um, you know, Maybe you're, I, I don't really know why you're coming up with opening these uses now when you didn't want to open them uh, up before because there, there was a lot of public demand. And I guess to my point, I think that uh, the the parking, even though you gave them a 25% discount for shared use, um, I'd like to see when that actually comes back. I think that there would be a lot of locals going there to some extent or people who are already in town uh, and I'd like to see there have been certainly studies done talking about that so I'd like to see a little bit more information about what you'd project because I think projections can be made in terms of you know the, the real parking requirements I certainly don't like hearing at all that every time we go over there it's like peeling back you know layers of the onion oh look these four spaces are gone oh look this is over here so uh, I'm in favor of opening this to the public but I, I still think that there's I don't know if we're going to need more oversight over that property I mean I certainly think that if we approve something and it's in the recitals and it's in the resolution and then to find that there's this drift over time that's what really keeps troubling me and um, you know I'm really willing to work with the applicant when you know they find oh we didn't want to open it a while ago now we want to open it so I'm going to support this resolution but again I, I don't like this continued drift and these changes oh no we can't do that but now we have to do this and uh, I, I am concerned about that but I am flexible when it comes down to the parking to really get try to get some assessment of how many people that are already parked in town, whether you're parked in your garage or you're parked at another property, may be using that. You could probably put the onus uh, shared with the town and, and the property because I think that should be taken into consideration. I really don't think that 
everyone's going to be driving from Napa or from St. Helena and looking for a parking place. I just have that sense. So, uh, with that said, I am willing to support the resolution. Thank you, Councilmember Durham. <clears throat> I am. I agree with Councilmember Muller as well. I, I support the use 100%, uh, and I think it's going to be a great asset. And I do think that lobby does add something that this community does not have. Um, when the time comes for the parking management plan, I think we need to have a long discussion about that to ensure that it's going to continue and move forward and be monitored um, and be controlled. I do like the things that were stated in the um, in the staff report concerning how that will be done with um, the stickers and with um, registering everybody. I just think we need to ensure that there's no confusion as to how that parking management plan works in the future as well. And as for the use permit today, I think it's a great idea. Thank you. Councilmember Dornbecker. Well, once again, we all seem to agree on both the um, use permit and then the discussion to be had later about the parking. But I do like the idea that um, it will be open to the public and there'll be another breakfast place in town, which would be very cool. And um, so I I support it as well. And Vice Mayor, you, you made your comments already. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I, will, I will agree with the uses also uh, being made available. Um, we went through a, a related discussion when Bartisona Hotel was coming online. And um, we it was actually the, the opposite what was happening their interest was to keep things private and we said they should be public and uh, it took the town's kind of insistence to make the spa and the uh, restaurant public um, and then later on they were more than happy to have the public access as it helped their their business model um, I saw this coming years ago for the same reason. It makes sense that you have an underutilized set of assets on the property that, um, yes, your guests certainly can use, but uh, you're still kind of underutilizing certainly the restaurant in particular. And the uses that you've added to the lobby area to make it a very comfortable um, setting for guests, I think that can extend easily to residents and, and other visitors. So. I can I can support all of these requests. Um, you're also in a unique situation where hours of operation, even for outside, don't impact residents, uh, and that's very fortuitous to you. As long as we keep it on the proper side of the property on on Washington, you know, toward the park, um, so that also makes sense for the uses you're talking about here. And you, you're hearing very loud and clear. You've already heard it before, but you're hearing it again tonight about how serious we're going to take. Um, the management plan that's going to be needed to trigger all of these uses. Um, one of the things that hasn't really been brought up, and we'll bring it up in more detail at, during that conversation, but I think the use of that south part of California is going to change as the Vine Trail starts to come online. When we have dozens of uh, cyclists that, that use that street as a major all-day parking lot for their daily rides, if they're now starting in Napa, they're not going to be parking in Yountville. And so we just have to factor that into our calculations as we're going forward. Are we going to be re getting back uh, at least uh, temporary use of spaces that are on the public street adjacent to the property? It's just something to consider going forward. But um, at the same time, we also have all seen a significant number of employees walk across the street and get in their cars on California during shift change. Uh, that um, they are clearly parking next to the uh, park. So um, you've heard the message uh, repeated multiple times. Uh, there's support for this um, access. Uh, it is a beautiful property. I think uh, members of the public that haven't been on property either ever or uh, in a very limited way will be pleasantly um, surprised when they come and see what you have to offer all of us uh, going forward. So. Those are my thoughts for now. It's going to be a conversation that needs to continue, uh, and I, you know, we'll talk to the town manager about when that next conversation uh, is going to be agendized. 
so that this could actually be put into effect? Um, two things that I want to make sure the council is really clear of that you have on this. The elements of the parking management plan are actually a condition of the action you're taking tonight. So I want to make sure that you all know that some restrictions related to change and how, uh, and I will also say that this is consistent with the action that we're taking on a lot of other properties. The one part which you've already provided me um, potential guidance and direction on, I will now work with the property owner separately and that will be coming back to you. So I just want to make sure that you realize with the action you're taking tonight, assuming that the um, a lease a arrangement consistent with the, the framework that was originally provided to the by the council to me and um, property negotiations is achieved, the registration requirements and all those things are in place. So you will be, you know, we will be finalizing that, bringing that back. But there is a framework that you've provided me with. Uh, in terms of those uh, conclusion of those negotiations and the terms but but I want to I want to clarify I, I tried to say it in case it wasn't clear enough on a, my last statement that even approval that sounds imminent doesn't mean these uses become available tomorrow that is correct it, because it still the other, is the, the other thing that has to happen a, a parking management plan there's, well there's there's two things with regard to that one is the plan includes the identification of the fact that there is this additional parking lot and you also have to build the facility because you can't open the uses up until the parking is prepared right. and ready. I so think I think we're clear on that. Item. So <coughs> is there a motion to be had? Yes, I'll make a motion to approve resolution number 16-3318, approving master plan development plan amendment, including design review amendment and use permit amendment to allow Hotel Yachtville located at 6462 Washington Street APN 03609026 and 03609038 to open the Y Bar, Hopper Creek Kitchen Restaurant, and Spa Aqua facilities to the general public. I'll second. <coughs> Motion and a second. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 That is unanimously passed. Congratulations on that. And we will be speaking about the next step. <clears throat> and thank you for your patience as we work through all of our public hearings tonight. We already have addressed our administrative item uh, that was next on the agenda, so we are going to move forward to our staff informational report on Hopper Creek. It's been a very busy creek. You're exactly right, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Tonight we have an update for the Hopper Creek Flood Control Project. I think it is timely since it uh, seems like the Hopper Creek is uh, needing to expand beyond its bank. So uh, in the past week, there hasn't been an awful lot of, of, of visible work um, with the few remaining plants and shrubs being planted, some ground cover being planted at the Oak Circle um, and Heather site. Uh, However, with the rain this week, we did have a few questions on um, on what exactly was going on with that project. There were some comments made on some social media. I just wanted to clear some of that up this evening. Um, some There was some concern that the work that we have done hasn't done much to alleviate the flooding at Hopper Creek and Heather, and, and they're right. That's because, the as you all know, the storm drains have not been installed yet from, uh, from here at the at the mm -hmm. west end of town, the Hopper Creek at the intake uh, at Fennell, and, and then the pipes will be traversing down Fennell, and, and then uh, the outfall is at Beard Ditch. So because of our utility relocation uh, process, those pipes have not been installed yet. However, the contractor is ready to go. We have secured a dirt dump someplace to get rid of our soil. We're just waiting for the weather to break at this point. Um, however, as you can see from the pictures, um, Hopper Creek at that location was quite full and um, it did um, spill over just for a short time for about an hour this morning um, from 10 a.m. to about 11. And once the rain um, let up, as was noted earlier, the creek went down pretty quick. So uh, that's kind of going to be what's going on right now. We're in saturated soil conditions. Main, the majority of the rain that falls up in the hills comes down here through town 
and if it holds at all here, the storm holds at all here, either in town or up in the hills, um, you're going to see a little bit of what happened today, which most of us who have lived in town for a while recognize as a typical 10-year storm or better with uh, water kind of spilling over and running down Oak Circle and or uh, Mulberry. <clears throat> we didn't see Mulberry spill today. However, had it continued raining for um, much longer at the at the rate it was raining or had this had the storm um, kind of held had a few more downpours you might have seen that happen as well so I think I should just caution people to remember the project's not finished yet and the biggest portion of what we're going to see with the uh, project is still yet to come so um, hopefully it will relieve some of that nuisance flooding that we've all kind of been used to seeing in these bigger storms that's from question. Question. So, to that discussion, do we need a period of three days or five days or two weeks before the company, I forget their name, is going to come in? No, actually, that's, that's a great question. So, they're at the point now where if it's dry, they can work. So, as long as it's not raining at 9 o'clock when they start, they can... Tomorrow it won't be raining, so they'll be out there? They, they, they will not be out tomorrow. Ah, we're still... We're still <laughs> they need to mow out, so they're, they're working on trying to get out. But I anticipate them being out next Monday with the Jim, weather reports okay. of long-range forecasts for some dry weather starting next Monday. And we're looking for them to get out. They will be out tomorrow to uh, repair some of the ditches that have been uh, sinking from some of the earlier street repairs right. and um, start getting some of that prep work accomplished. Um, it wouldn't surprise me to see them start trying to do some excavation and plant some manholes ahead of the pipes going into the ground. However, I haven't ha had a conversation with them relating to that um, evolution. So it wouldn't surprise me to have them show up tomorrow. On the other hand, um, I, don't, I don't anticipate them getting ready to start putting pipe in the ground tomorrow. So we don't have to move our cars in Heritage. Okay. You don't have to move your... I, I will say that that's an, another great comment, just to follow up on that comment. So there have been a few questions about the Heritage uh, neighborhood and access um, and our response and, and what, we requ what we required in the conditions for the work is that at least one access of the two be open at Heritage at all times. So there may be some delays. Um, if you have a preferred method to get into and out of heritage, but you will have access at one end of this neighborhood or the other at all times. Yeah. It's, it's really communication. Uh, maybe we can keep the uh, next door Yonfil, you know, information kind of going out because I tell people to call me anytime and they take me at my word. <laughs> well, I, I will say that we will be using a variety of social media, okay. Priya Nixon. Um, our management fellow is, is uh, very skilled at getting those messages out. We're trying to use a wide variety of, of media to make sure that everybody is aware of what's going on. Um, and next door will be certainly one of those. Also want to remind everybody use. associated with this project, we actually have a project website and a, a tracking mechanism, so all of those residents. I do think what you're going to see is when we're ready to mobilize, we will walk the neighborhoods again with a handout to remind them of the game plan because basically we're still going to execute the same game plan it's just three months delayed and it's going to have to have a weather factor and a little bit of common sense that people are going to have to apply but those same elements that commitments that we made to in terms of progress you know they will work incrementally from beer ditch coming to hopper and uh, most of that work will be in finale so um, the biggest the biggest impact are going to be to the through traffic that use Fennel. Right. Residents in Vista will be able to get out. They may have to traverse through um, the Vista neighborhood and out um, Washington Park in that area when they're in the middle of it. That's going to be the biggest impact. And we'll walk through and keep everybody so everybody knows where we're at with that. But Fennel will, will Fennel always have a lane open for local traffic or at some there, point the whole thing is going to be closed there, 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 will, there will be at no point where will the whole thing be closed okay. but there will be portions of that road that will be severely limited and restricted obviously um, when, the, when they're in the middle of the intersection right that will be challenging that will be very challenging the, again the terms of the permit and our conditions for the work were that the road is not closed for any longer than 20 minutes at a time so people should have access 
give or take within 20 minutes of, of one needing to have that access so residents who certainly live at those areas on Fennell that only have Fennell as an access um, that's why we originally intended that time limit but it's going to apply to the entire stretch of work on Fennell so um, as long as they have access and they're able to transition people through the heritage neighborhood or through the Vista neighborhood back through Washington Park that that meets the terms of the permit and I expect them to use those to try to do the kind of work that you're talking about that could be challenging for access and and the need, work they need to do okay councilmember Dornbecker uh, yes. looking this way <laughs> um, and Joe just to clarify so you say that when the pipes are installed at Fennell that is going to alleviate the problem at um, Oak Circle and Heather we I, the modeling suggests that it will have it will have an impact so what you will see is probably less of the nuisance flooding like today where it just barely spilled over we anticipate that that probably won't be the case in these type of storms certainly in the larger storms all the all of the things that we're used to seeing are probably going to occur um, maybe not to the extent that we see them occurring now but I would say you can expect that the kind of nuisance flooding that we saw this morning will probably not happen on the regular basis that we're used to seeing it so that's one thing those pipes are going to solve for sure well I'm really glad that on Oak Circle and I, we I've been calling it our new duck pond because we have uh, two families of ducks living there now so you now have an environmental relocation issue on your hands <laughs> Uh, and uh, maybe maybe we can uh, encourage PG&E to come clean up the mess they've left in the uh, Vista neighborhood with their uh, uh, spray painting and uh, mm -hmm. breaking of the curbs and and subpar filling of their vaults etc. I, I had a conversation with uh, PG&E this afternoon, anticipating that very question and comment this evening. I have their commitment that they will be here in two days to remove the paint marks on Vista and Forrester um, as soon as the weather breaks they're going to try to get the paving and concrete done on Vista and Vineyard Circle uh, they will be out the, the contractor will be out tomorrow to to um, try to put some temporary patch into the into the patches on Fennell yeah those are getting as as the they photo are. I sent you today indicated yep. potholes in in the sagging trenches now yeah. potholes in the potholes <laughs> yeah but there's also still uh curb damage on vista left over from some of that trench work from yeah they're, they're going to restore they'll restore that um and also do the paving there on um the San Fennel for that first part of the work that went on that was not associated with this work but became associated with this as the delay went on and on and on yes we don't want to go back on that conversation again Okay, any f more on the update? No. I think that covers it. Any Thank you very much. From council? Thank you very much. Uh, we have some uh, meeting reports. Actually, flood control meets tomorrow. Uh, no, NCTPA oh, no. meets tomorrow. Flood control meets next Tuesday. And uh, is there a mandatory report on Upper Valley Waste Management that all the Christmas trees get picked up by somebody um, people chopped them up or they had free you could take them to the dump for free so they're all gone that I know I haven't seen any laying around the street but uh, anyway we have, have picked up a few they did pick up a few no we have the town did oh the town did okay that's why I haven't seen them well, good them job you guys. so don't be too nice to people because then they'll keep putting more and more out next year. So it's anyway, Upper Valley uh, Waste Management, the uh, January meeting was canceled. Our next meeting is February the 8th. Very good. Um, reports and announcements. I, I certainly wanted to bring up the fact that um, Yountville at our community center is hosting a Super Bowl, excuse me, the NFL Pro Football's 50th championship game um, at the community center on s September 7th uh, we have a very unique opportunity of having uh, six uh, Hall of Fame football players joining us to uh, tailgate and watch the game interact with uh, folks that buy uh, tickets and the uh, event is going to support brain injury research uh, done by the Tug McGraw Foundation. Uh, 
as it relates both to sports injuries and military combat injuries. So uh, it's a very good cause and a very fun afternoon. So make sure you check out the Town of Yonville or the uh, Chamber of Commerce website for more details. You might want to amend that because you said it would be on September the 7th rather than February, February 7th. 7th. And I have an yes. announcement too. I don't know why I was thinking September, but February 7th. Thank you for that clarification. Um, Vice Mayor, did, yeah. And, either did either you, I can go first or second. I don't care. Are you going to talk about the crab feed? I am, but you're welcome to go. Well, Vice Mayor, go ahead. All right, they, thank they, you. They so if everyone uh, hasn't marked their calendar, you have just several, three, four days left to get your tickets to the Kiwanis Crab Feed. It's going to be this Saturday. We're not sold out yet, are we? Are we? We're getting close, though, so get your tickets now. We're very close. Plenty of crab. Plenty of crab. I guess it's been authorized to uh, to be utilized. We're getting it from a, a safe place. So um, hope to see everyone there. Yeah. Uh, no guarantee. I'm a vegetarian. So. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully no one has heard that through the McMute that we have on your mic. Um, with that being the case, uh, this Saturday night, bring your money. The uh, money for or the monies go to a good cause. It's Yachtville Kiwanis, which supports local youth and different programs um, that we have here in the community. And so I look to see everyone in council chambers and on TV there this Saturday night. Thank you so much. And uh, I want to thank Yachtville Kiwanis for stepping up and supporting the NFL watch party also with a fundraising opportunity there. Councilmember Moeller, did you have anything further to add about the how, the crab feed? Well, yeah, because, you know, you're always supposed to go who, what, when, where, and why. So it starts at 6 o'clock, and it's going to be in the community center. So there you have it. The rest of the year. On Saturday. I should have had you do it. He did. He, he got, he got, he got set. Yes, yeah. Why. He got at, that at part. great risk, I do need to make one small caveat. If I'm not mistaken, the wine reception starts at 530 so we, we do the hosted wine in, that's included as part of your ticket with some of the great Yountville tasting rooms um, from at starting at 530 as the precursor as you then move on into the main dining hall in the community center. And don't forget your crab hats and your crab shell crackers. And your checkbooks. And your check. Any other announcements? I have no further comments on staff or council members tonight. Uh, we have no thank you. We have no closed session uh, on the agenda tonight, which is great. So I'll entertain a motion for adjournment to so February two at six p.m. That was Councilmember Moeller, seconded by Councilmember Dornbecker. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you and good night.